Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Zach Bell. I'm the chair of the Standing Committee on Education and Economic Growth. Uh, it is Tuesday, September 21st at 1 o'clock. I do want to welcome uh, everyone here this afternoon watching online, uh, also to the media and to our guests. Uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome uh, all of our members. Uh, first, we have Gordon McNeely. We have Trish Altas, Stephen Howard, Hal Perry. Subbing in today for Minister Hudson, we have Corey Deagle, and we also have visitors, Michelle Beaton and Carla Bernard. Um, a full house for a full agenda. Uh, first, uh, can I possibly get a adoption for, or a motion rather, for the adoption of the agenda? Sure. Gordon? No, I just have, uh, <clears throat> at this time, I'd like to maybe move a motion um, around the agenda that, uh, that we not limit the number of questions asked our time spent on any of the four presentations before us today. And further, if we do not have enough time for a full unrestricted debate on all four presentations, I move that we reschedule any of the remaining presentations for another day. So that's the motion I want to move just, just uh, at this time. Um, the back to school plans and ensuring um, in, uh, and the outbreak is the biggest issue currently facing our province and Islanders deserve a full debate and discussion on the topic without question limits or time constraints. Every issue today uh, is very important and deserves the time and attention paid towards them. I fear that imposing question limits and time restrictions won't allow that to happen. Okay. Um, so the motion, clerk, could you read the motion back? Sorry, first. Uh, yes. Um, I would like to move a motion that we do not limit the number of questions asked or time spent um, on any of the four presentations before us today. And further, we do not have enough. If we do not have enough time for a full, unrestricted debate on all four presentations, I move that we reschedule any of the remaining presentations for another date. Okay. Okay. First of all, is there anyone else who would like to comment on the motion, Stephen? So, uh, would, which? presentation would we be starting with if this motion goes forward? It's very important, the order that we would uh, have those presentations put forward. It's a good question. Um, as we do have the current, I understand that, we, as we do have the current uh, group in to present on the economic impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, for women in right now to present, my thought process would be that we would go ahead as in our original order. If the motion is to pass, then the ask would be to the presenters to try to get them to come in at another time. But also keeping in mind that we do have a relatively full schedule from now until the House starts. So does that answer your question a little bit? I believe so. We'll be talking about women's recovery and then the back to school plan. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Corey. Is it just the, is it just... Is there any different presenters coming in for different sections, or would you have to call people in earlier? Or is everyone here? You okay, Thank you, thank you Chair. It's uh, yes, it would be different presenters um, depending on the subject. So. Okay. Perfect. Thank you, Trish. Thank you, Chair. So, um, you know, from uh, where I stand at this point, I think there's no need to reorganize the agenda. That would be very difficult uh, for our presenters, and I respect, you know, their time uh, and that they are already, you know, prepared to present in a certain order. But I do agree with Gord that it is a very full agenda, and uh, I don't think it is appropriate to uh, to limit questions on any of, of these topics. So, uh, just at the outset, uh, to make that clear that. Uh, they will, the topics will be discussed for as long as needed and should, uh, and we need to reschedule the later topics I, uh, in, in this agenda. I think that that would be the most appropriate thing. Okay. Thank you, Trish. Anyone else care to weigh in? Okay, perfect. So there is a motion on the floor. So uh, all those in favor of the motion, uh, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? So the motion has passed. So uh, we will continue on with our, so now I ask for, <laughs> this is new for me and I appreciate the, uh, so now I ask for the uh, motion, the current motion to be adopted with amendment. Yes. Correct. Okay, so with your motion passing, Gord, I now ask for a motion for adoption of the amended agenda. Court. Thank you. All right. So we will start off with the briefing of the economic impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on uh, women. 
Um, I'll get you all to introduce yourself and for Hansard, and then you can start with your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I'm Natalie Jamison. I'm the Minister of Education and Lifelong Learning and the Minister Responsible for the Status of Women. Go ahead, yeah. Hi, I'm Michelle harris Gange. I'm the Director of the Interministerial Women's Secretariat. And Bethany McLeod, Deputy Minister of Department of Education, Lifelong Learning. Perfect. So if you're ready, you can start with your presentation. Okay. Thank you, Chair, and, and uh, hello, and uh, thank you for the invitation to participate in today's discussion about the economic downturn and its impacts on women and plans for economic recovery. As Minister Responsible for the Status of Women, I have a unique and challenging role. Although I don't have direct ability to make decisions for government departments outside of my own, I do have the responsibility and opportunity to work with my colleagues in Cabinet to ensure women's unique needs are represented at the table. I've had many conversations with Ministers on this topic, and I would like to extend my appreciation for all Ministers and members of the Legislative Assembly and their commitment to consider the needs of Islanders and all genders and diversities in our province. So first off, it's really important to acknowledge that um, the COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in different labour market impacts for women in PEI and all over the world. So it's not just unique to Prince Edward Island. And it's likely the result of higher participation in the industries where, that were more severely impacted by public health restrictions, such as retail and, pub, and uh, personal services. So data indicates that the female labor force characteristics were improving pre-pandemic. So prior to the pandemic, employment had been increasing for both men and women in PEI. And this is a trend that has been observed since 2016. So in 2019, women accounted for 49%, almost half of employed persons in PEI. And the female unemployment rate has been trending down over the last number of years and reached 6.6% in 2019. And male unemployment was 10% in 2019. And so at 70.4%, uh, the female participation rate still lagged that of males and averaged 62.7% again in 2019. So we're looking at before the pandemic. And then so baseline 2019 data indicates that employment for women was concentrated in a limited number of sectors. So healthcare and social assistance, wholesale, retail trade, public administration, educational service, and accommodation and food services. And in 2019, these sectors accounted for 70% of female employment. So post pandemic, um, the future outlook for female employment, it looks promising. So female employment should continue to recover through 2021, as the sectors that employ many women continue to experience robust growth. So except for accommodation and food services, all of these sectors, so wholesale, retail trade, education services, healthcare and social assistance, public administration, all of those pieces have exceeded their pre-COVID levels as of July 2021. And according to the Job Vacancy and Wage Survey, the industries that had the most openings were industries in which had been historically dominated by women. So retail trade, health and social assistance, and educational services. So, so far in 2021, this year, the employment situation is recovering, but the recovery is uneven between the genders. So on a year-to-year -year basis through August, employment was recovering for both men and women. Employment has grown 4.4% for men and 1.3% for women. As of August, so the last data we have, uh, men had achieved 99.3% of pre-COVID employment, while women had achieved 93.8%. And the unemployment rate for men has averaged 10.2%, while for women, it's averaged 8.5%. And women's participation rate averaged 60.1 and men's averaged 70%. The participation rate has declined for women, down 2.75 percentage points, while for men it increased 1.1 percentage points. And the employment rate increased for men through August, up 0.9 percentage points, while for women it declined 0.9 percentage points. So it's a lot of data there, and I recognize that. Um, and so there's also difference within genders too, so just kind of explore that as well. 
So male employment declined less severely and recovered quicker, whereas female employment declined more severely and has yet to fully recover. So there is a differential. And males aged 25 to 54, and when you talk about 25 to 54, that's the core working group, it's kind of known as that, has largely seen their employment exceed pre-COVID levels since September 2020, while males 55 and over have seen the, sen uh, the same since December. And employment for females aged 25 to 54 recovered between May and December 2020, but since then has remained around 95% of pre-COVID employment. And youth employment um, continues to be well below the pre-pandemic levels, um, although they spiked for, spiked for young women in July this year to above pre-COVID levels. So it continues to look different within and between genders. So females 55 years and older, followed by females aged 15 to 24, are the groups that are furthest away from pre-COVID employment. And this trend has persisted throughout the pandemic. And males age 55 and over remain very close to pre-COVID employment levels, but have seen a slow deterioration in their employment levels over the past six months. And then when we talk about part-time employment, um, part-time employment has recovered more quickly than full-time employment. So as of August, uh, part-time female employment achieved 101.2% 101 of pre-COVID levels, while for men it was 97.4%. And full-time employment for males achieved 99.5% of pre-COVID levels in August, while for women it was 91.9%. And on a year-to-year -year basis throughout August, full-time employment has increased 1.6% for males and 1.1% for females, while part-time employment has increased 31% for males and 1.6% for females. And just kind of talking about the main reasons why women choose part-time employment versus men, it is different. So for women, um, it was the main reason was personal preference, 32%, and then caring for children and other voluntary reasons. Um, and so that's a 12%, and business uh, conditions was also 12%. And then for men, the personal preference was 33%, and then business conditions was 20%, and then going back to school was 13%. And so uh, the committee is also asked to talk about a number of specific items today, including the gender wage gap. And so I'm just gonna kind of give an overview within the presentation as far as the gender wage gap and what it is. So it can be measured in several different ways, uh, but normally it's measured as the difference between full year, full time earnings, or the differences in hour hourly wages, so those two specific pieces. And it's between men and women and is generally expressed as a ratio. And when we're talking about the gender wage gap, it is very binary, so we do talk about men and women and not the spectrum of gender in between. And so the gender wage gap in Canada, which is a Statistics Canada research paper, found that there was no statistically significant gender wage gap, or gender gap in hourly wages uh, in PEI in 2018. So it was 24.33 for men and 24.18 for women. And also, based on the data from the 2016 census, or our last census, the unadjusted gender wage gap uh, based on full-time, full-year earnings was 84%. So women earned 84% of males' earnings. And based on this method, the gender wage gap in the island was the smallest in the Atlantic region and smaller than the national average of 75%. So studies strongly indicate that affordable, accessible, quality childcare will close the gender wage gap in wages. It's a strong contributor. And affordable and high quality childcare can remove some of the burden placed on women, especially BIPOC women, because of gendered expectations of who does the care at home. And as we know from last year, and as recently as last week and, and before, school and childcare um, facility closures particularly affect women because they still bear the major responsibility for childcare and the increased responsibility for schoolwork as classes moved online. So access to childcare is one of the biggest factors for women in the workforce. If it makes economic sense for a woman to stay home, many make the choice to stay out of the workplace entirely. is responding and we will reduce child care fees for children aged infant to school entry to an average of $10 a day 
or lower for low-income families by December 2024. So there are currently 7,199 island children from birth to age four. There are currently 4,050 licensed early child care, childhood spaces in Prince Edward Island. Over the next five years, the province of Prince Edward Island will increase the number of licensed spaces for island children from infant to school age to meet the Government of Canada's targets. Prince Edward Island will add 452 licensed childcare spaces over the next two years. Not all parents work standard hours, as we know, as in particular part-time or seasonal workers, many of whom are women. In 2022-2023, the province of Prince Edward Island will engage in consultations to explore solutions to the delivery of alternate hour care for children whose parents work non-standard or seasonal hours. So in addition to providing opportunities for women to work, um, the child care sector also employs many women. So wages will increase for early child care providers, and there's also plans for recruitment and hiring in the child care sector, including the creation of a return to the early years incentive grant for individuals who have left the sector. There's funding for earlier centres to hire an additional staff person and create an innovative practice grant for centres to explore non-monetary initiatives to enhance retention. So as already noted, um, the COVID-19 pandemic had a significant impact on the workforce participation of women across the country and in our province. And to help with the economic recovery, the Department of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture implemented targeted investments to improve the workforce participation of unrepresented populations, including women. Minister McKay and Minister Jameson co-hosted sessions with women's organizations and industry stakeholders to discuss women's economic engagement and recovery. And these consultations, um, that, you know, they engaged with women's organizations for insight um, as the department prepared the design of the COVID-19 Workforce Integration Fund to support projects and programs aimed at getting women, youth, and underrepresented groups attached or reattached to the workforce. Targeted investment in 2021 um, with that department has focused on economic recovery efforts and assisting islanders who have been most impacted by the pandemic, including underrepresented groups like women. And targeted investment examples for women as part of the economic recovery program includes uh, partnership with Women's Network uh, to support women transitioning from low-income situations to sustainable employment through career exploration and college prep into the skilled trades and industrial, industrial technologies. Also partnering with East Prince Women's Information Center, supporting women to increase life and employability skills and job placements and partnering with the PEI Business Women's Association to assist women in business across PEI impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. And these skills enhancements, enhancement supports include access to a professional network, peer support, and both professional and personal development required to ensure business success. And the Women in Construction Trades Project is a federally supported Atlantic project that encourages women's participation in the construction and trades by providing a one-year mentorship placement. And also, very recently this year, uh, the Interministerial Women's Secretariat will be providing um, annual funding to the PEI Business Women's Association uh, for micro grants. So, getting the money out to the women directly. So, unfortunately, to to finish the presentation part of, of the meeting, um, we're going to feel the ramifications of COVID-19 for years to come. It's just a reality. And to develop a path forward, um, we're utilizing gender and diversity analysis, engaging with women's organizations to hear their experience, their expertise and wisdom about ways to implement programs and that work for women that are equity-based and facilitate women's economic recovery now and into the future. So thank you very much. That's great. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for keeping the uh, presentation uh, uh, going moving along, I really appreciate it. Um, so we are going to open it up to some questions, and uh, whoever wants to answer the questions, uh, just uh, again, maybe if you want to put up your hand, just for uh, Cynthia and answer. All right, uh, Trish. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for this uh, presentation. Um, I do have a few questions. So going back to your slide on the gendered wage gap, 
Um, you talked about the difference, first of all, between the gap in hourly wages and as measured that way and as measured uh, in full year, uh, full time employment. Uh, and that the gap uh, at, at full time, full year, as uh, women at 84% of men's wages. Is that a percentage that you have seen uh, change over recent years, and in what way? It hasn't changed a lot recently. Um, and so PEI has historically done better um, than our, you know, than federally or our Atlantic counterparts when it comes to the. Uh, the gender wage gap, and particularly when it comes to uh, pay. So, and I don't know if you want me to talk about gender wage gap now as far as the different ways of doing that or like uh, well, Trish. What, yeah, thank you, Chair. So one of the things I noted in the Women in PEI Statistical Review, as I understand it, is that in 2015, we were in the low, women were at upwards of like 90% of what uh, the gen, of what men were making for full-time, full-time, full-year workers and it's gone down to 84%. So that's really what I'd like to, uh, you know, just to touch on here. And I'm wondering if you could explain, you know, what's happening there, uh, if, if you know, and, uh, and you know, what, what you think might be done to uh, reverse that trend. So as far as going down 5%, I'm not sure, like, you know, but there could be a couple reasons. And, you know, when, it, when it's about, um, you know, where women are clustered, you know, we're very particularly clustered in different um, different job positions and placements. Um, and the places where there is higher income, you know, construction and places like that, there's not a tendency for women to, to be in those fields and in those realms. Um, so that could be it, because that's where the higher wages are, is in those, and as far as um, pay, you're going to be making more in those industries than you are in other industries. Um, as far as uh, other reasons, you know, it would be me just kind of uh, giving my own opinion on some of those things, but it's just around those, uh, the clustering and, you know, and as far as, uh, you know, retail work and things like that, that hasn't really gone up at the level as other uh, industries have. Trish? Yeah, thank you. I think there's certainly a lot to unpack there, and I think yeah. it's, it's it, you know, we, it's very easy to be quick to say, you know, PEI has one of the smallest gendered wage gaps, but it, it does still persist and that it is getting worse, um, I think is something that is worth taking note of and uh, ensuring we're doing everything we can uh, to, to reverse that trend and make sure that we stay on, on the path of uh, uh, equity in our, in our workplaces. I, I also want to uh, talk about another way that you mentioned that uh, um, you know, women are more likely to be the primary caregivers for children or to have to take time off if, you know, they're caring for children. Um, uh, you didn't mention elder care, but of course that's another another area we know that women are, are more likely uh, to be uh, primary ca caregivers for loved ones. Um, uh, we haven't seen any uh, progress on legislated paid sick leave, but I'm wondering if you could uh, talk a little bit about the impact that paid sick leave has uh, for women workers and their, their, uh, and, their, and their lives. So as far as the differential impact between men and women, um, there would be, there would definitely be more of an impact on women than there would be on men, um, full stop. Um, and for the reasons that you had mentioned, you know, as far as when um, it is the decision to stay home with a child, when it, you know, a decision to provide elder care to, um, to your parent or whomever um, you're caring for. Um, historically and traditionally and, and today, it will be the woman who does take that time off. Um, so if that is the question as far as would it impact women differently and would it impact women more, the answer is yes. Trish? Yeah, and I think, you know, we've just touched on a couple of areas um, and, and, and more in your presentation, where certainly the economic recovery for women, um, uh, you know, there are other factors to consider, and that, um, you know, for women, that uh, there was a, a greater decrease, uh, a decline in employment over COVID, and that the recovery has been slower. Um, it certainly points to the need for an, an economic recovery plan that is specific to women and ensuring that we are doing, the government is doing everything it can to uh, support women to uh, 
to engage in and uh, and and continue their continue employment uh, in the labor market. So, um, do you is that something that has I haven't seen anything like that yet. So I'm wondering, you know, is there is that something that's being worked on to your knowledge? Uh, you know, what, where is that at? Um, as far as where that is at, I can't speak to that. Um, maybe Minister, you'd like to, but. Um, there has been engagement with the Women's Secretariat um, on that, and there has been engagement with women's groups. Um, and quite honestly, I just have to say that I'm very excited <laughs> of the interest, you know, when it comes to gender inequity that has not existed. I've been doing this work many years now, both in government and in community. Um, and the interest, and in, it's unfortunate that it took a pandemic for that to happen. Uh, when it comes to, you know, gender and diversity analysis, but, um, you know, I'm really appreciative here to be able to speak to this today. Um, I'm appreciative of the interest both within government um, and in community because, you know, what COVID did was shine a hot light on, you know, who was in, like, where the inequities lie. Um, and to a point where we just can't ignore it anymore. Um, so for many years, you know, uh, women's organizations, equity-seeking groups have been saying this and talking about this um, and maybe being ignored or, or undervalued. Um, and it's very exciting that um, that's changing. And so I'm really appreciative of that. Trish? Oh, sorry. No, sir. Thanks, Chair. And, and I can, uh, firstly, I, I just want to take this opportunity to say thank you to Michelle and, and her team. Um, as you can see, Michelle is incredibly um, passionate about this subject, and I feel grateful every day that she's at the helm of the Interministerial Secretariat, Women's Secretariat. Um, and, and as uh, for for the uh, Premier's Recovery and Growth Council report, so that's expected to be released here in the in the coming weeks, and certainly um, our group has provided input into it throughout the course of the last uh, number of months. Trish? Yeah, so it's, you know, it is, it's very um, interesting and, you know, concerning in many ways to sort of unpack some of the data around you know, what the impacts have been specifically for women. And looking at uh, Statistics uh, Canada labor data, it looks like about, um, uh, from my understanding of, of reading it, uh, 2,400 women approximately have not returned to the PEI workforce um, after the pandemic. Uh, while men's economic, men's recovery or men's, you know, returning to the workforce has actually exceeded pre-pandemic levels at this point. Um, so when we talk about things like labor shortages, which we hear again so many businesses are facing, it would seem to me that women's recovery, women's economic recovery, women's ability to engage effectively in the labor market uh, should be a primary concern uh, and, and a major focus of, of the plans to, to uh, restore and, and, and vital, revitalize our economy. Um, I also note that, you know, as, as you mentioned in your presentation, that women are more likely to work in, in, in different sectors than men. Uh, one I think of in particular is, you know, not-for-profit organizations. So um, with predominantly uh, women employed in, in not-for-profits in, in many cases, I'm wondering, um, you know, what provisions are being put in place to, to support those organizations at this time? Um, and, and have you seen any impacts or has, have there been any impacts for the uh, community sector labor market specifically? If you want to, I, I can. <laughs> um, so I guess in my world, there has been an increase to the, uh, the grants, which I'm really appreciative over. Um, thanks to Minister Jameson's advocacy, um, the grants have increased. And um, yeah, any support that is provided to the community sector, again, in that differential, um, there's going to be a differential impact on women than men because there are more women um, in those industries. So the support that is provided to community organization is, is vital for women's economic recovery. Trish? Um, thank you, Chair. So. I'm also wondering about something we didn't, wasn't really unpacked a lot in, in your presentation, but the fact that women are more likely to be working, you know, part-time, uh, more, more likely to be working in precarious employment and positions, uh, so short-term contract positions. Um, I'm wondering if you have uh, any, anything you'd like to, uh, to touch on about how do we, um, 
how, what can we do to uh, support women more effectively uh, moving forward to have more uh, long-term, uh, stable, uh, well-paid employment? Because uh, we know that's an ongoing issue, and it certainly seems it's only got become more of an issue um, now, you know, post-pandemic or during the pandemic. Yeah. And on that, um, I was worried that we're, we're presenting the day after the election. <laughs> and so there were a lot of... Uh, things that were on the table at the election, and one was childcare. Um, and uh, I'm really happy, but, and I don't mean this in a political way or anything like that, but just as far as the agreements that, you know, started off with the childcare agreements um, with the federal government, um, I'm really hopeful that they'll continue. Um, because quite honestly, there's no greater imperative than having access to affordable childcare. Um, it's one of the biggest economic drivers for women. Um, and because if you can't afford to work, you're not going to. If it makes more economic sense for you to stay home, you're going to. You know, people want to do what's best for themselves and for their families. And I think probably all of us know women who have not made money while they, were, while they had younger children because they wanted to stay in the workforce. Um, and those reasons are also why women choose part-time precarious employment. It's to be able to take care of, of their children. Um, and so that puts them at a, a huge disadvantage in a lifelong way. Um, so if they stay within um, the workplace, and again, in places where there's not a lot of move for, uh, room for movement up, or they take a break um, to stay home with their kids for a number of years, that means that they're not up for the job, you know, uh, they don't have the tenure. They don't have the ability to uh, to get the promotions that other people do, and so it's it's a disadvantage. You know, men who have children are not economically disadvantaged. Women who have children are, and even if you don't have children, um, you're kind of seen like if you're within the childbearing ages of are you going to get pregnant? Are you going to get pregnant a couple times? Is that going to be disruptive for my work? Um, so I think you know. As, in addition to system changes, we have to have like a societal zeitgeist change as far as like how we see women in the workforce and you know the engagement of women in the workforce and the importance of women in the workforce. Because you know if you if you don't create safe spaces for women to work, they're also not going to stay engaged in those places where um, where we need them to work. Thank you, Gord. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thanks for talking with this important. Topic and there's a lot of good discussion so far. Um, as the minister responsible for the status of women, specifically, how did you advocate for island women whose lives were impacted by the pandemic? And I know you said you met with a bunch of groups, but how how did you advocate for those those people? I think a, a really excellent example of that is the Workforce Integration Fund um, that Minister McKay and I uh, co-hosted uh, with. With the uh, with the community groups, and certainly we've here heard some some tremendously good feedback from community organizations. Um, it's got it went a long way, uh, especially at the beginning of this year, uh, to support them and and to to further uh, enhance some of the programming that they were able to offer. And as Michelle had already spoken to the importance of childcare since the day I was elected. Uh, I have been a very, very strong advocate. Um, I'm, I'm living and breathing it currently with two small children, and I think my, my colleagues are getting probably tired of me talking about childcare, but I, I can't uh, stress enough the importance of having quality, affordable childcare um, for myself and for all families. So um, I was really pleased um, in our budget, uh, our last in the, in the spring, we saw a 41% increase in our operating budget, um, which was historical in nature uh, for the early learning and childcare sector. And then to have uh, signed on the agreement with the federal government, not all uh, provinces and territories were in a position whereby they could sign on. We're really fortunate. Uh, we have been leaders in, in um, here on Prince Edward Island, and we are well positioned to sign that agreement. And it's uh, it's exciting how it's unfolding. Gord, <coughs> thanks, Minister. Did you you had mentioned um, before the the Premier's uh, Recovery Council report, and it was going to be released in a couple weeks. Um, 
or I don't know what, when it's going to be released, but maybe that would be one of my questions, if you know. And um, do you, uh, I'm concerned that it's incredibly delayed. And it just, I want to see what's inside that information. I want to see what's in there. And there was apparently some edits back and forth. Did you, did you, how did you put a lens? Were you able to see that? And did you put a lens on that um, uh, for, for women? Yeah, thank you. And, and I don't know exact timelines, but I understand it'll be in the next couple of weeks whereby it's been released. Uh, there were a lot of stakeholders uh, heavily involved in the process. And uh, and certainly um, we have been directly, I know Michelle, you've been uh, and your staff have been have been uh, directly engaged um, through it. And, and also with the discussions that we have with, with some of the community organizations that are, are involved, um, it's uh, it's 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 not one department or, or one one person leading it. It's really a, a combination of um, many groups across Prince Edward Island, um, and I'm looking forward to it being released as well. So. Gordon, um, my question too during COVID, we did get a lot of support from CERB and from the federal government, but I'm focused on the, the provincial programming and could those have been stronger for women? And the reason why I ask is just recently with the West Royalty um, outbreak, it was a small little delay and, and then they were going to put programs in for that three or four days. Well, I was approached by, you know, um, uh, uh, a female that's working in a field that had to cancel all of her classes. and. Then she was really worried about, she's really working hard. There was nothing there for her. Um, you know, and that's the things that, that I, I wrote a letter, obviously, to Minister McKay and talked about that. But how do we, is that a gap? Did, are, are we doing enough to fill those gaps for women, the ones that are unemployed? Or, you know, something happens with, with COVID and they become unemployed. They work for themselves. They're trying to make it. Are we doing enough for that sector of the population? Do you want to speak to that? I th I, I, through through our department, I, I I'll let Michelle expand on this. But I think um, through our department, I think that as Michelle had indicated bef um, previously, there's never been as much attention paid um, to to women across Prince Edward Island and and um, and their 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 livelihood and and. Oh, oh. Health and wellness and all of it, right? It's it's all taken being taken into account. Um, certainly, we I know you know when when the um, West Royalty cases uh, came about, that was one of our, our first discussions was with uh, Minister McKay and, and his staff, and, and they were quick to uh, to roll out a program to help support um, individuals in a situation whereby they did have to isolate. Um, so I think that we've been really um, quick to to react. Um, certainly recognizing that this has been a challenging time for islanders and especially women i uh, i can't thank our child care facilities enough who who've stayed open through all of this um one thing that we did here on a national uh front was um you know should a should an outbreak occur um please please ensure that childcare uh, remains open. And, and our, our child care facilities, they, they stepped up and they offered those emergency, uh, um, uh, that emergency service at the onset, and then they've been open ever since, all of them. So, so we're really, really fortunate to have had that sector um, step up and, and support women and families throughout. So um, I think that, again, we've been really, really, uh, it's, it's been a, a, an incredibly challenging year and a half for, for island families and, and island women specifically. So I think we've done um, a great job doing whatever we can to support, support women, and we will continue to as we move forward. Gord? One more, and then I'll, I'll pass the floor. And it's, it's an important one. And when you look back at the pandemic and, and the studies and, and when that first came, a lot of discussion was was around uh, domestic violence in the early days of the lockdown, um, how it affected our nation, and, and I'm just looking for, um, there was a trend across the country. Was it observed in PEI, and and how, can you just talk a little bit more about that, because it was a very serious issue, and, and as we're watching, we're all concerned, but 
Um, just maybe I'll just open the floor to that kind of topic for you, I guess. As far as the trend, no. Um, but, you know, as far as, uh, you know, were there more people accessing services? No, which, um, which I guess might have been surprising. But the other piece, too, is that um, I would say the cases that were com coming forward were more complicated um, and maybe more severe. Um, so it would be more taxing and challenging for the groups that were providing that um, group, like within both in government and community. Um, to respond to those complexities and and uh, so yeah it was so when I say was there a trend in you know increased amounts no but um, was it incredibly challenging like in the response from the service providers yes Stephen thank you chair um, we've heard a lot about childcare today and I absolutely agree it's uh, very fundamental aspect of creating some equity within our society when it comes to this topic of uh, getting women into the workforce. And, and on that note, um, I mean, we, we just had a federal election where the outcome, uh, th that child care agreement was in the balance. Um, we had Aaron O'Toole very vocally say that he would be cancelling that agreement. And I'm just wondering, um, recognizing that the ministers here is telling us that it's extremely important and, and uh, the probably the most important at way we can achieve those goals. Why would I be seeing uh, pictures of the minister out supporting uh, candidates that were uh, against this, or that were planning to cancel it if they did win? Um, I mean, I saw most of cabinet out there supporting various candidates that were supporting candidates federally that wanted to cancel this child care agreement that you're here trumpeting to us as so good. And I agree, it's good. But why then were we seeing support for? Certainly. Thank Thanks, Chair. I, I certainly can't speak on behalf of the rest of my, my cabinet colleagues. Um, and uh, and I, can, I can speak to the fact that I, I did uh, speak at, at Doug Curry's fundraising dinner. Um, that was many months ago. Uh, I, I certainly never never knocked at a door um, with, with Doug. Um, the fundraising dinner was prior to the, the platform. Um, being rolled out by by the federal conservatives, and I uh, I have to, you know, just say kudos to anybody who put their name forward uh, in in the federal election. It takes a lot of guts to do that, and and uh, I'm I'm really uh, I really um, I, I just. I want to say congratulations to all who, who won, but also congratulations to all who put their name forward. But um, certainly, again, I uh, I think, you know. I want to support anybody who's running in politics. I, I if it's you know from the NDP, um, whether it's from the Greens, if anybody comes to me to, to have a conversation around the political process and and participating in it, I think it's really important that um, we as elected officials um, give them the time and and the space to, to discuss and and so the opportunities and challenges as we know there are many. So uh, again, um, really pleased to to see that we'll we'll be. Moving forward with uh, with the the uh, agreement uh, with the federal government um, on childcare, and um, I uh, I know it's going to benefit a lot of families here in Prince Edward Island. Stephen, thank you, Chair. I agree. It's going to be an important step. Um, I suppose another way to ask this question might be: What was the plan if the outcome last night had been different, and we would have known that the uh, childcare um, funding was going to be disappearing? What what was our plan then? Certainly, as I as I said, I'm really proud of the operating budget that we had put forward um, back in the in the spring. A 41 percent increase to, to early learning and childcare. Again, his, historical in nature, and I uh, I won't stop at that. I'll continue to keep advocating for for dollars for the sector who does um, so incredibly much, and, and for families who who need uh, childcare support. So. Um, for again, we're in a position today whereby uh, that's not something that we need to consider. We we have this agreement in place, and I know that the the federal government will will step up and uh, and make sure that we continue to move forward on this important uh, investment. Stephen, thank you, Chair. Um, has your your department, your government, been funding the Best Start program uh, as it was previously? Yeah, it has. Um, absolutely, it has. Yes. Yep. Yeah. yeah, it was in the budget. 
we we supply the base funding, like the one point, I think, don't quote me, 1.4 million, and then the Best Start um, wage program to bring some of their workers up to the wage grid was funded through health and wellness. Yeah. Stephen. Thank you, Chair. So that wage grid that they are brought up to, is that uh, bringing them up to sufficient wages in the department's opinion? Yes. Yes? Okay, Chair. Thank you. Hal. Oh, thank you very much, Chair, and thank you, Minister and Deputy Minister and Michelle, for coming in today. Um, we talked a lot about uh, child care. So the province has introduced their own um, child care plans, um, but I know there have been some concerns raised um, about the uh, availability of space and of staff, and especially in, in rural uh, PEI. So um, has it been challenging to increase the number of spaces and uh, particularly in rural, rural communities? Um, glad you asked that question. We're recent, or recently, we have announced some great initiatives coming forward. One of them is about the accelerated education program for our ECEs. And the excitement we've had and the interest that have been shown by ECE workers is, has been phenomenal. But with that, there's the program called Steps for Success. And what that does is we bring in people that don't may not have any training in it, but we bring them in to work in our centers. And then we actually, they earn their first level um, for ECE in that. And that's paid for, it's supported through skills as well. Um, and we, we were very successful in that, and that's hence why we're repeating it, but we hope to double the um, occupancy or the participation rate in it. Um, so that's one thing, but you do talk about rural areas, and that's something that as soon as we actually have one on our desk right now that we're dealing with up in your area, and that's something that if we have to look at um, establishing a program, it may not be at full capacity, but we're looking at ways that we can that we can offer that to these people that right now I think there's, I think you probably brought them to our attention, but about four right now. But each case we deal with, and the department is phenomenal at doing that, I can speak very well for our directors and our ADM that, that we deal with those as they come across our desk. Hal, uh, thank you very much, Chair, and thank you for that. So I know it's it, it, it's a challenge, and I know it's it's a challenge for parents uh, to get uh, spaces for childcare, especially in Ropia, in my district. Um, and I get a lot of requests for people to ask for direction or, or to advocate um, for them because there are school teachers who are going back this fall who are coming off maternity who can't find uh, childcare. So. Originally, the number of new spaces was, I think it was 300, and then it was, uh, this spring, I guess it was dropped down to 241, 200, 241, yeah. So, um, what was the overall number of new spaces that were opened? So, I don't have that exact number for you, um, Hal, but I will make sure I get that for you. Okay. And you Hal, also, uh, where yes. they were opened. Yes. Uh, yeah, yep. I would appreciate that. Um, so how many um, ECEs were hired this year to service the additional spaces that were opened? Okay. I, I, sorry, Chair. I think these are incredibly um, good questions, and I think there'd be value in perhaps bringing the folks in from early learning and, and child care to speak to some of the specifics, because Bethany and I currently don't have uh, the... The, uh, the stats in front of us and the updated stats because we weren't prepared to speak to that. But I think that uh, we, again, we have really professional um, staff within the department that I know would be happy to come and, and sort of address some of those very specific questions. And I'm just going to interrupt for one second, uh, Hal. Do we have the, is that group coming in on the 20, uh, 28th to present to us? That's Kathleen. Yeah. Okay, good. Hal? I just wanted to say, Childcare has been mentioned several times here, and it was one of your primary concerns um, with, uh, especially women getting back into the workforce. Or, or, or um, so that's why I'm, I'm asking about the new spaces that are available because they need those spaces. And they need that childcare available to get back into the workforce. Um, so aside from affordable childcare, uh, child and, and I'm really pleased that. Um, the province will be moving forward with the $10 a day. Uh, that's a game changer right there. 
So that's fantastic to hear. So um, what are the strategies um, are you recommending to, um, to government to help get women back into the workforce other than the targeted investments you mentioned in your presentation? So I think um, some of them, and I, I did speak to it a bit, but you know, just as far as getting um, women out of those clusters where they are. So when we're talking about you know, engaging women in the trades and, and things like that, so the funding that goes to uh, groups like Women's Network to do the Trade Horizons program, um, you know, that was switched over from annual funding to multi-year funding, so that was a change. So things like that, which also, you know, speaking to the, the NGO sector, you know, having that multi-year funding is also a way so that they have security in future years of funding as opposed to doing applications every single year, um, you know, spending time on the application process as opposed to doing the right work that they do. So things like that um, will have a, a huge impact. Michelle. Thank you, Chair. Hi, and thanks for being here. Um, so I just wanted to go back to the best, the best start program. My understanding is you said that they're funded, they're paid, their wages are paid through funding from your department and then topped up by the Department of Health and Wellness. Why would we take a funding structure like that instead of just paying them what they're worth and putting them on the wage grid and actually giving them security in their, in their salary so they can depend on it so that they're not worrying, worrying about two different funding pockets. We, uh, we actually had a meeting scheduled with Chances um, for this, this past week um, to discuss specifically this. Uh, unfortunately, the meeting uh, they had to cancel because they, uh, they, they were, were dealing with with the, the stressors around um, some of the cases. So uh, it's certainly something that we're going to be in discussions about, and, and I appreciate you bringing it forward today. Yeah. Michelle. Thank you, Chair. Um, and I can appreciate that. I have a chance. It's in my, in my um, district, and it was actually during the election when I first found out that this was even an issue. And I guess I just don't understand when we're trying to bring women up to wage parity, why we wouldn't just address that difference in the salary instead of making the mask for two years and going through different pockets of funding in order to try to get a livable wage to the people that are looking after some of our most vulnerable islanders. If we are really going to be the voice of women, we have to make women give women the resources that they need instead of having them comp constantly having to ask for them when you know it's an issue in the first place. So it shouldn't be something that takes two and a half years to implement and have it done vicariously through funding. It should just be done and so that these women can act, well, mostly women, I'm going to assume that they are based on the description you've given us, um, based on the fact that you know, we know that that's a challenge. And we're losing them from that program going to the ECE program because there's better wages there, although they're still not livable wages. Um, so I appreciate that you're going to have that conversation. It's definitely a question I'll bring back then when we're here on the floor of the legislature. Um, I would like to know, you listed a whole bunch of programs that you that have been initiated. Can you tell me the value, the dollar value of all of those programs that have been initiated in order to get women into uh, back into the workplace? I don't, but I can um, get that number from the Department of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Yeah. Michelle? One more question. This one has to do with special needs children within early childhood, um, and I guess or um, EA straight through the school system. So my understanding, because we've had this discussion based on a constituent issue I had, um, the, the, for a special needs child, the go-to is to give them a special needs assistant for four hours of the day. And that is what everybody's offered, not really based on what the needs of the child is, but that's where you try to start. So when we talk about part-time employment, and vicarious work and how do we get women back into the, in, back into the workforce, forcing, um, first of all, parents with special needs children to have to fight to get more hours for their special needs children when it's obvious that they need more support. But then putting out job postings for four hours of work, part-time position to those that are mostly women, 
why are we doing that in the first place? And why wouldn't we just recognize that special needs children actually need a special needs assistant with them for the whole day? And then that would create full-time employment for primarily women who work in special needs as a special needs assistant, as well as parents with special needs kids who need that dedicated time in order for their children to get to the point where they start thriving when they're in the school system. Um, and I appreciate you having brought this family's concerns forward um, to me there a couple of weeks ago, and I, uh, I hope that um, you, with, with the help of our department, they were able to reach a positive conclusion for the children. I haven't heard otherwise, so um, I hope that that's the case. I, uh, I do um, recognize that, that this is something, Michelle, that... Uh, I am, I am hearing as, as a concern, and I know that uh, with our federal agreement, um, we will be enhancing wages for our, our special uh, needs assistance and our aut autism assistance. Um, but also, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm going to personalize the experience. So, for example, Tiny Tots, it's a, it's a bigger facility. Um, they're able to accommodate more children, more families, and they were able um, to employ uh, full-time special needs uh, assistance within the center who were there on a, on a permanent basis. Um, that's not always the case um, for each facility because they do apply if, if they know that there's a child uh, coming in who has, who has uh, exceptional needs. Um, they apply for that funding, but I, I recognize that that is a concern and it is something I'm hearing, and uh, together we are having some internal discussions around what we can do um, in the future to better support um, those those workers and also the families. Yeah, yeah one. Okay, thank you. Um, so, but on the salary side of it, you're forcing these workers into applying for part-time contracts that doesn't give them any kind of security for their employment because we have set this standard of four hours a day where I don't even think that a parent should have to actually reach out to the department to get the need that would be identified from their physician or whomever is doing putting forward those um, those needs. Why would we even put out? Uh, how how do we justify forcing women into part time employment that does not have any job security, doesn't have any benefits, doesn't have all of these things that really give us security whenever we're in the workforce? That's what we're talking about here. How do we have a better um, economic? Um, recovery for women when government is only putting out part-time positions when we know we could be filling those potentially with full-time positions and that it's needed so why is it even um, why is it even something that we're talking about or negotiating at this point in time no, that's, that's an excellent question excellent point I actually recently had a, a discussion with somebody who's a real expert in the, in the field and and their suggestion was was possibly looking at you know, designating um, specific centers as uh, as those that you know could provide those those opportunities for full time employment and and um, and have a more consistent approach to the way we look at um, servicing special needs and exceptional needs families and children. So I think it's uh, it's it's a really excellent point and um, certainly something that I'm really passionate about as well. Uh, there has been a lot of discussions internally um, as to, to how we move forward. Um, and I look forward to providing updates on that because it's it's something that is really important to island families. Just before we continue on, keeping in mind that we are, keeping in mind Gord's motion originally, we are approaching 2 o'clock. Is it the committee's wishes to continue on with uh, questions or would we like to maybe near an end and uh, move on to our next topic? Yeah, Trish? Continue. Continue on. Perfect. Carla? Thank you, Chair. Um, when I see we're having new child, we have new child care spaces coming, of course, that's, that's wonderful news. And one of the conversations that you and I have had minister several times is um, that I had been hearing from the sector that in many cases, the centers have lots of room, and I can think of a couple of examples. They just don't have the early childhood educators to, to fill those positions. And we argued about this a bit because you didn't 
see that as a problem. So, so in hearing when I heard the deputy saying there's the new step program, so it sounds as though this has been identified as a problem now. Am, am I hearing that correctly? I, um, I'm, I'm trying to think back to any discussions whereby I would have suggested it, it isn't a problem. I, I think we, we realize that we do need to, to train um, more educators and make it a, a career path that um, that folks can can see as a has 20 year or 30 years retire retire into it right um, because we do see a lot of educators that that uh, get involved and, and unfortunately we can't retain them so um, there are yes there's there's um, a number of different ways we're addressing um, the uh, the recruitment and retention of, of early uh, of educators um, through programming at Holland College. Um, as I said, the, 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 the steps for success through ECDA, um, also just addressing wages in general. Um, and, and we've talked about, I know, um, one of the commitments or one of the uh, items in the, the agreement with the federal government was around um, a pension plan of sorts. And, and we don't know the details around that yet, but um, certainly something that's uh, very exciting for the sector, so I'm hearing. Carla? Um, that's really great news and to go through Hansard and look at several question periods where I brought this up as an issue and you said it was not an issue. So I'm thrilled to see that something has changed where you understand that is an issue now. Um, a couple, I'm just wondering, there was something, again, I know nothing about these new programs, but there's something that, that you had said about the, the STEP program and so you take people with no experience and just paraphrasing a bit, and put them into the child care center. I'm wondering if there's been, at any point between your department, any consultation done with the child and youth advocate to see, to kind of consider things that maybe we as adults may not consider when we, as we consider early childhood education and, and the risks that we may be taking by having people who aren't necessarily um, trained or, you know, some people just have that in them and that's fine, but there is a safety risk there. And so I'm wondering if you've consulted with the Child and Youth Advocate on any of these programs. I would, I would have to bring um, the department in to talk about that, but I know that, you know, these people would be, you know, a vulnerable sector check and criminal record check, like all of that. They would be, because uh, essentially they'd be registering for the program at Holland College, was, which is where they take the education for this program. So they would be, you know, they would come with it, and, and I apologize if it made it sound like we're just picking people off the street. These would be people that have expressed interest, and, and the 24 that they had in the last program, every single one of them has remained on, so. Yeah. Carla? Thank you, Chair. And just I have one more question and just a quick comment. Um, I think that it's important, that especially given um, Department of Education Lifelong Learning, that the Child Youth Advocate is someone that you have regular contact with because we as adults can say, yes, they have a criminal record check, but that doesn't go deep enough to ad address ch children's rights. And so just kind of throwing that there. Um, another quick thing I wanted to throw your way and then I'll ask my question. One of the issues I'm hearing and that I've actually experienced myself is getting children to after school care and the buses being at capacity. And so people not being able to get their children to after school care because of a bus capacity issue. So I'll throw that your way. My last question is, um, this morning I had, we had a great meeting with uh, Minister Jameson, Minister McKay, as well as the deputy, and, and actually everyone in this room here on the other side was there. And um, we talked about different things. We talked about apprenticeship, we talked about sexual harassment in the workplace and women in trades kind of specifically, and, and a few different themes emerged. And so, I think one thing that we can say we've learned this morning, certainly one thing that I knew before, but you know, was highlighted, was that we can't throw money at this to, to make it go away. So I'm wondering, Minister, what takeaways that you have from that meeting that you are going to run with and champion? Yeah, I thought, I thought that was an excellent meeting myself, and I was really uh, pleased that you reached out and, and that to set it up. I think that there was a lot of value in getting everyone around the table and, and having that discussion. Um, I, uh, I, was, I was impressed um, with, with some of the comments and, and some of the, 
vulnerability of the, the person who shared their experiences with us. Uh, I'm, and, I, and I was thinking about, as we were speaking with individuals, I, I was thinking about all of our discussions that we'd had last week, or a couple weeks ago, with the Construction Association and some of the, uh, some of the experiences that women were having in, in the trades. Uh, I think that there's a, a lot of education that needs to be done, and I know that in speaking with Sam Sanderson, he's, he's quite um, committed to, to working with the trades um, to support to support the education component around um, some of the possible, you know, sexual assault that can occur in the in the workforce. So I haven't uh, I haven't really had enough time to digest our meeting yet, to be quite honest, Carla, um, and to 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 meet with staff um, to determine next steps. But I really appreciated the time uh, and and the uh, again. Um, the concerns that were brought forward, and, and I look forward to working with Minister McKay and his staff on, on next steps. So, um, stay tuned, and we can we can set up a follow up meeting if that if that works. Yeah. Thing off the top of my head, some of the things that I would have taken away as kind of immediate things to champion would be to do a jurisdictional scan to see what other provinces are doing about sexual work what <laughs> sexual workplace sexual harassment about their apprenticeship training. Um, I would ensure that that education program, the, the sensitivity training and the international training that they spoke about were put in every single program, that every union, that every workplace was aware of them, that there would be visits to the workplace that weren't scheduled so that people are, you know, are, um, are being their true selves. Um, and because this, to, it's a huge culture shift that needs to happen. You know, things that, that we find funny that we found funny, you know, 10, 20 years ago. It's not, it's not funny anymore. We've come to a point where it, it's, we've got to do something about this. So those were some of my quick takeaways that I would have, would have had, and, and I look forward to a follow-up with that. Thank you. Trish? Thank you, Chair. So I just wanted to go back uh, a little bit to our discussion around uh, not-for-profits. Uh, um, you mentioned, or was mentioned, the, uh, the role of grants that were, were received uh, in uh, supporting those not-for-profits and, and, you know, their workers, which are predominantly women um, in most cases. So could you just tell me how many um, uh, not-for-profit organizations received uh, grant funding and at what level? Perhaps, Minister, that would be a question for you. Um, well, I'm thinking if you're asking all across government, we wouldn't have that answer. We could get that answer and bring it back to you, but that's not something. I know I don't have that number. Grants that were provided through the integration fund, um, they're they're not provided through our department. Um, so we can we can get it for you, but uh, it's it's would be through um, the Department of Economic Growth and Tourism. Yeah. Trish. Yeah, well, that makes sense that it is through another department, but of course, you know, with it, the impact on women's employment being so significant here. I mean, uh, you know, my understanding, most of those <coughs> grants are about, you know, $20,000 a year. Uh, so we're really talking about, you know, essential base funding for organizations uh, that allows them to continue to apply for other, you know, uh, project-based funding. So it is critical that organizations have that. But there are so many, so many not-for-profits that do not have access to that base funding. Um, I think the thing that's... The twenty thousand dollars. That that's where you are talking about the interministerial women's secretariat grant. Okay. Um, and on that, I, I can speak to that as far as um, the funding. So, something that we have heard, um, particularly within the women's community, is that there has been a lot of consultation um, taking place over COVID, and a lot of expectation on community as far as um, you know extra work and and all of that, and the consultation fatigue. Um, and so, in recognition of that, there has been an increase from 20,000 to 30,000 for those core groups. Um, and then, with that, um, that's for the core funding to do with as they they see fit um, in their wisdom and and report back so that we sure we're assured that everything is going well. Um, but uh, in addition to that, it doesn't um, keep them from applying for extra funding through the project-based uh, funds too. So. Previously, um, one of the stipulations for getting the project-based funds was that you couldn't be core funding, uh, core funded. Sorry, so we we took that off too. So there have been a couple of different changes there that I could speak to. Yeah. And, and further to that, chair, if you don't mind, um, through the interministerial women's secretary, we increased the grants by a hundred thousand 
as well. Yeah, 130, 130 was it? Yeah, 130. Um, so, so virtually doubled it. Um, something that, again, women's group has been a asking. So we can't, again, we can't speak to things that are outside of our periphery. We, we influence them. But uh, within the department, we have seen uh, increases to, to our budget and, and also um, to the grants. So, Trish? Thank you. And of course, funding that is provided or that is available outside of your department, uh, you know, uh, that wouldn't be targeted, in my understanding, specifically to uh, look at how we can support women more effectively. Or, you know, as this kind of goes back to the earlier discussion that there is, we don't, haven't seen an economic recovery plan for women. So I think it's difficult to point to the success or, or, or not of those programs uh, in terms of women employ women's employment specifically. Um, I want to note uh, that, you know, the third sector in PEI, it's, it's, uh, um, it, it, it's a significant uh, employer in this province. So, um, you know, we don't have uh, recent data, is my understanding, um, but uh, that it was, uh, there's over, you know, a thousand not-for-profits in, in the province employing, uh, you know, over 6,500 uh, um, uh, people. So, uh, I, there was a, a community sector labor market study um, that was underway, I believe, or should be underway or completed with the, in collaboration with the United Way. And uh, I'm wondering, has that study been completed and uh, when we will we'll be able to see that? I haven't been invited or involved with that, so I'm not really sure. Yeah. Trish? And, and we'd have to get that, get that back to you yet. Um, Trish? That's that's um, that's it for now, Chair. Thank you. Right, thank you. So, if there are no other questions, um, I do want to uh, thank you all for coming in and uh, taking a little bit more extra time uh, with our committee today. Um, so, we will take a short recess and we will bring our next presenters in. Thank you very much.
Uh, welcome back to the uh, Standing Committee on Education and Economic Growth. Uh, for our next uh, presenters, um, a few familiar faces from our last presentation. Uh, so maybe if I can just quickly get you to uh, all introduce yourselves. Is that uh, all right? Perfect. It's right here. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Natalie Jamieson, Minister of Education and Lifelong Learning. Governor, Director of the Public Schools Branch. Bethany McLeod, Deputy Minister of Education and Lifelong Learning. Tamara Hubley Little, Director of English Education Programs and Services, Department of Education and Lifelong Learning. Terry McAdam, Director of Student Services, Public Schools Branch. Gilles Arsno, Director of French Language School Board. Kelly Drummond, Director of Human Resources, Corporate Planning and Principal Support, Public Schools Branch. Perfect. Thank you all for uh, coming in this afternoon. I believe you have a presentation. And uh, then uh, once the presentation is done, we'll open the floor to questions, if that's all right. Perfect. Thank you everyone for having us here today and, and accommodating the change in schedule. Uh, last week I was out sick for a few days and we uh, really appreciate the committee rescheduling our presentation for today so I could be part of the conversation. As Minister of Education and Lifelong Learning, the safe return of students, teachers and the wider school community has been a top priority for my department. And we are so pleased to be here today to share with you the details of our back to school plan, how it was developed, what it includes, and how it continues to evolve. This has certainly been a collaborative effort. I want to thank all the members of our education team, including experts in curriculum, social development and operations, the Chief Public Health Office, our school authorities, and all those who have and continue to inform this plan. We all have the same objective, creating a safe and learning environment for our island students. This plan, while my team, which my team here today will explain in more detail, was always intended to be a living document. Research is evolving and the virus is evolving, so we need to be flexible and ensure that our plan is evolving as well. I'm going to introduce, actually, I don't need to do that part because you've already heard their names and their, their titles. Uh, they, they are, um, I'll take this opportunity to thank them all. They're a wonderful team, so I'm really, uh, I'm really pleased to, to uh, have them beside me here today because they, are, they, they step up uh, in incredible ways, and I, uh, I, I count my blessings every day to know that they're, uh, they're, they're working um, with us and, and for this province. So. Um, so before I hand things over to this professional team, I, I want to say that we are so very proud of the tremendous job that our teachers and our staff have been doing, as well as our students and their parents. This week in particular has been tough for many Islanders. We have students who are in isolation, we've added additional substitute teachers to support remote learning, and all our schools have moved to, moved to their operational plans for elevated risk. At the heart of all the decisions we make is the students. We all have the same desire to ensure that our children have a safe and supportive place to learn. So thank you again for having us here today. And with that, I'll turn things over to the Deputy Minister, Bethany McLeod. Thank you, Minister. And as the Minister said, we, uh, our top priority is our students and our staff. Um, I want to provide you, I, I guess, with a, just a little bit of background on how the plan, the back to school plan and how it was created. Thankfully, we had a successful 2020-2021 school year and with a few, very few interruptions in, in class learning, um, we were one of very few jurisdictions that were able to have this happen, so we were very thankful for that. In the spring of 2021, um, discussions were ongoing for our fall plan. I think like everyone in this room, we all thought the light was at the end of the tunnel and it seems to have dissipated again for a little bit. But um, we, we were hopeful in spring that we would be going back to a near normal fall. Um, and as the educational experts, we focus our schools in the education of our children, how we can support and protect our students, the curriculum we need to have in place and being ready to move to remote learning if necessary. Um, understanding this, that it was always, you know, front row and center in the pandemic and, and that we are in the midst of a global pandemic. In May, we met um, with PSB and CSLF and we made an ask to government for COVID-19 supports. And this was without knowing what September would bring, but we wanted to ensure that those supports were in place. And this was approved. Um, and I know it was very welcomed by the unions and, uh, and the PSB and CSLF. 
and that allowed us with over 200 new staff were added as, as part of our back to school plan. Uh, in August, we brought together principals, school administration department, um, education authorities, and the CPHO staff to do a tabletop exercise. Um, CPHO provided direction for the development of elevated risk operational plans for individual schools, and principals then worked on developing that. Um, in early August, the PSB, CSLF, and Dell had discussions with CPHO regarding the new normal plan. Um, this is where we talked about having the two levels. So we had the low risk scenarios and what the minister already alluded to, what we're in today, the elevated risk. Um, it was always the direction that the Chief Public Health Office would determine when elevated risk measures were necessary. Um, and we relied on their expert um, health and medical advice. Um, guidance was provided by CPHO on August 18th. This provided us with the health and safety advice, which is reflected in our plan. Um, our back to school plan was released on August 23rd, 10 days before the start of the school year to ensure the most up-to-date information was being considered. And at that time, um, I know I checked into this just before I came as well, we looked back and the numbers of COVID cases were very low at that time and they were all linked to out of province travel. Um, like other jurisdictions across the country, the return to in-person learning with limited restrictions was established as a new normal. And I know just in discussions with my counterparts in the Atlantic, that was the same stance that they were taking as well. We were, I think, all very hopeful. Um, we received feedback. Uh, once the plan was released, we received feedback from parents, CPHO, CSLF, QP, PITF, PSB, and Home and School Federation. And then the plan was revised to include the ma additional masking measures. This was always intended to be a living document, as the Minister outlined. And when we receive new evidence and recommendations from CPHO, this plan has and will continue to be updated to reflect what the experts are telling us. I hope that provides you with a bit of background of how the plan was developed and evolved. And now I'll turn it over to Norbert Carpenter to speak to the operational plans, uh, risk scenarios, and a few other items on the list there. All right. Uh, thank you, Deputy, and uh, thank you, Chair, for the invitation to be here today. And uh, I realize we have a short presentation and we'll be available for questions after. Um, just to point out a few things, um, I do realize you received a package that spoke to the importance of in-person learning um, and some credible authorities around the globe that have, have talked about, uh, you know, evidence-based research uh, about the importance of in-class learning. Um, so us in cooperation, when I say us, the public schools branch in cooperation with uh, the Department of Education, lifelong learning, that's has always been our goal, um, to have students in class when they can be in class. And our work intersects with the work of CPHO in developing any plans. So in terms of this school year, the school operational plans, all 56 of our schools, and then speaking for the CSLF as well, um, and their schools bringing us up to 62, we all have operational plans in place, similar to last year. Uh, but as the deputy just referenced, um, in early spring last year and right up until the end of the school year, we were in talks with uh, CPHO about where the science was moving us. And it was um, certainly quite possible at that point that we would have limited restrictions uh, for students, which we know was optimal. And these discussions um, continued over the summer in early August, um, the plan was still to have very few restrictions in place. And so our classrooms would look pretty much like normal going back to 2019. However, the concern was the variants of concern, especially the Delta variant, and plans uh, were adjusted um, after the release on the 23rd. Um, so every school does have an operational plan, and the way the plan uh, was devised it was broken up into a couple different categories, um, the low versus elevated risk, and also some short-term measures versus long-term measures. So the, in terms of short-term measures, the things that we've all 
become accustomed to. Uh, you know, good hand hygiene, physical distancing, some masking measures, uh, disinfecting at school, and then some long-term measures as, as well, which would include improvements to ventilation, which I'll speak to in a moment. Um, so right as the school year began, as the plan was released, we were in a low risk situation across uh, the province as advised by the Chief Public Health Office. And as the school year uh, started, um, things had to be tweaked right away. Basically, you saw some more stringent masking measures coming in. And unfortunately, we had uh, cases um, during the first weekend of the school year, um, which was unfortunate, um, not where we wanted to be. Of course, I think the response has been very quick. Um, and we were able uh, to work with CPHO and give them everything they needed for contact tracing so they could do their work. I do want to acknowledge the work of our staff. Um, no one wants to start a school year that way. Um, our professional staff at the school level on the front lines have worked very hard um, in all our schools, and in particular the schools that were affected. Um, another um, key point, so right now we are using elevated risk scenarios in our schools, so all operational plans have been updated to uh, reflect elevated risk situation. Uh, uh, situations. Another couple of things that are key in the planning is uh, the use of cohorts. Um, so last year we had cohorting in place um, in our schools uh, where possible. Uh, as the plan was devised and developed this year, cohorting was not an expectation um, but was referenced that maybe it would need to be implemented if things changed. And things did change and the recommendation from the Chief Public Health Office and, and our viewpoint as well was to uh, have cohorting at K to six. Um, as we know, that's the unvaccinated population. Uh, cohorting is a little simpler, if you will, at that age. However, it, it is difficult and it comes with some challenges. Uh, and some of the challenges are the student's development, their social connections, um, their social emotional development. Um, however, uh, when advised, um, that we were moving to an elevated risk, we, we made that adjustment. So all our K-6 students are cohorted now. A um, Couple other key points uh, that I, I feel is of interest to this group and, and all Islanders probably uh, is vaccinations. So we were asked uh, to get some baseline data and that was the request, baseline data uh, of all our employees in the system uh, to see where our vaccination rates were and the vaccination rates were collected voluntarily from our staff and uh, you know the average was above 90 percent which exceeds um, you know the double vaccination rates in the general public um, however uh, we do know there's been increases um, to that rate since um, because many of our staff members were uh, in the process of acquiring their second dose um, However, you do know um, that we are moving towards uh, mandatory vaccination test policy, um, which through the good work of our human resources department, uh, we are ready to press go on that um, and we'll be implementing that, that policy. In terms, the last two things I'll touch on is masking, as we, we know the importance of masking. Um, we did uh, ad, uh, adjust just recently again um, to um, include four, grades four, as the science has told us, that uh, students 10 and above transmit the virus uh, similar to adults. So that's why that uh, decision was made. And I, I do want to make it clear, we're educators. We want to educate our, our students in school where they need to be. But we do heed the advice of the medical experts, and that will be, that's what we did in this case. So four to 12 uh, mandatory masking in our schools um, when physical distancing is not possible. And the last point I will touch on is, is ventilation. This has uh, sparked a lot of interest in the, in the public and in the media. And um, to be clear, um, we have and we've been forthcoming despite some uh, presuppositions that we haven't been, that um, we take ventilation seriously. The science has changed throughout the pandemic. We are, um, have been open that we have 46 of our 56 schools have mechanical ventilation which we now know uh, provides better uh, better air quality um, these systems were all uh, tested and um, maintained uh, as the school year began in august uh, we realized there's 10 schools without and we're in 
collaboration right now with the Department of Transportation and Infrastructure um, to, to work on the funding that's available to improve the ventilation for those 10 schools, which is, as I said at the top, is a long-term measure. So in consultation with Dr. Morrison's office, um, there was never an expectation that ventilation would be improved right now. Uh, her ask to us was to improve ventilation long term, and uh, we're committed to doing so. Um, so I, I'm sure you will have questions after, but that's all for uh, for me at this point, and I'll turn it over to uh, um, Tamara Hubie Little. Thanks, Norbert. Thank you, um, and good afternoon. Um, I just I want to uh, touch base on two um, aspects of students accessing alternative education. And the first one I will speak about um, is our home education um, registration status. Last year, we had 350 students registered for home learning, for, for homeschooling this time. Um, as of Thursday, we had 210 students that were registered for a home education program. So we are seeing a number of students return to in-person learning where they would have been out of school at their parents' request for the full year last year. So that's great news. Um, as Norbert already mentioned, in-person learning is so important for our students. It is what our system is built on. Our curriculum is developed um, to focus on in-person learning. And while we do have an opportunity for students to participate in virtual learning, um, there is so much evidence, um, especially for our young students, that we, may, we need to make sure that we understand that in-person learning is our default and it is our, our standard in PEI with our public education system. Having said that, on the occasions when we do have students who are required to be out of school, um, it's, it's, it's important to highlight um, two scenarios. So at the high school level in particular, um, last year we had 23 students who uh, participated in a virtual education program because they were not medically able to attend in-person learning. Um, at this time, we have three students in that particular situation. So we are seeing a return um, of students to the in-person learning, and it's very good news. And we can, we can link that, I think, directly to the fact that um, that age group at the high school level um, has been able to get vaccinated. So let's turn our attention to our, our youngest students, our K-6 K to six students that are in that unvaccinated category. Uh, developmentally, and you do have the handout um, that I've provided around some very reputable organizations, internationally and nationally, that um, highlight really the importance of in-person learning. It's an equalizer in our community, quite frankly, for our students who are most vulnerable. And, um, and I don't need to explain to you as MLAs in various jurisdictions across the province how important it is to um, have students in school and be that equalizer socially, emotionally, physically, um, and so on. So um, I want to talk a little bit about West Royalty School. Um, and we did see the need to move to remote learning. And um, as a result of a direction from CPHO, we, we, you know, we saw that the transmission in the community made its way into our schools. And so very quickly, um, teachers uh, worked to put their remote learning plans in place. And we, um, we had a number of classes where there was a whole class that was self-isolating. And the teachers of those classes continued to provide remote education to those students. Now, granted, it took some time to get that up and running. And uh, if you think back, if maybe some of you are parents and you think about the, sh the sharing of information that has to happen at the beginning of the school year. Um, so that information sharing um, is crucial to us being able to um, implement the remote learning learning plan because we need to, um, email addresses, we need phone contact, uh, phone numbers um, to contact parents. So we did have um, a little bit of a time lag there, but uh, as of Wednesday, those um, teachers were able to begin remote learning with students and continue to provide remote learning for those classes. 
So we also have groups of students who um, have been directed by CPHO to self-isolated that wouldn't necessarily be um, a member of a whole class. And as is the case with our students who are homesick for a period of time, teachers will be working um, in collaboration with subs that we've also provided to support um, the, the development of these learning packages um, because we do want students to be able to continue with their education. It's complicated in that um, you know, students are coming in and out of, of their classes and that, that, um, that sharing of information uh, between the home and the school, it takes time to happen. So we are encouraging um, families to get in touch with the school to let the school know of the um, self-isolation status of students so that the school can respond appropriately. It's okay. so important for us to be able to operationalize our policies. And just one final comment before um, I turn it over to you for questions. Um, the, the sharing of information so we can operationalize. Even, even last night, I was having a conversation with the principal of West Royalty, and we had to update our policies because as we were working through them, we realized that you know, th there was a communication lag um, between the parents being able to share the status of their children's self-isolation um, dates with the school community. So, so we are very fluid in responding and making those adjustments as, as we need to. And so on that note, I will, um, I'll stop there and, and back to you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, we will open it up now for questions and maybe just to make it a little bit easier uh, for Cynthia, if you are going to be answering the question, if you just might want to put up your hand quickly and that'll let her know to turn on the microphone. Kind of like back at school, right? <laughs> All right, uh, we will start uh, with uh, Gord. Uh, thanks for coming in, and, and uh, uh, it's, 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 it's a tough situation for everybody. And um, just uh, the, the, the back to school plan, um, who has the final sign off on the plan? Well, ultimately, the, de the department does. Gord? So the department has the final, who's the department? Like who's, who has the final sign off on the back to school plan, the very last step? Who is the final, wh where's the accountability for the back to school plan? Who does that lie with? It, it would be CPHO. We are, as I alluded to, we are the educational experts. So. We know exactly, uh, you know, most cases what school will look like in the fall, but we were relying on the medical because we are in the middle of a global pandemic, so we have to rely on what the expert medical advice is, and I, I believe Norbert alluded to that as well. Okay, so Gord? But it, it's your plan. It's, the, it's, it's education's plan. You, you had mentioned before that you had got received guidance on August 18th from the CPHO. Is that, who, who, who is responsible for the plan? Outside of the CPHO, who is responsible for the plan? So, uh, Mr. McNeely, we're, so we're definitely involved, if, the, if that's the question. So, um, we're asked as the operational authority, uh, speaking for the public schools branch, if, if this plan is, is doable, like, after CPHO have it and they propose it to us because if we weren't in a pandemic, there wouldn't be a plan because we know how to operate schools. So they give us guidance and parameters and ask us if we can can live within these parameters. Um, and that's not really, I shouldn't say ask, they're, they're giving guidance. And it's our job to make sure we can follow the guidance and operate schools safely. Um, so that, that's the input that we have from Gord? It, it just seemed like this, the, the plan it was only released on August 23rd. Um, you, you said you consulted with, uh, on August 18th, the CPHO. Um, what, what, what role did the Premier's office play in this plan, if any? 
They certainly would have been consulted on it as well. So Dr. Morrison um, had uh, had developed the guidelines, and, and as we know, uh, the Delta variant is ever changing, and, and um, certainly she was um, in constant communication with other jurisdictions. Um, so so she would have put forward the guidelines um, to to us. All of the individuals, well, most of the individuals you see here, and as well to the, the Premier's office. So should we, Gord, sorry, should we have brought the CPHO into this meeting today? Um, you know, I, I just, I'm, I'm confused. Gord, you still should, for? Should, because I'm just trying to figure out, um, there's a certain something called mysterious mysteri accountability, and I'm just, I don't understand. Um, where this plan starts and stops and who is accountable for it and that's that's where I have some problems with with what we're what we're talking about because right after the plan came out I mean there was there was stuff in the media I just couldn't figure out who was responsible for the plan and you know that becomes a concern for me so when we're dealing with your responsibility as the students and staff across the board Okay, I understand that there's a pandemic, but the, I, I believe that the, the buck stops with the people in this room right here. Um, is, is, can you assure me that all staff and teachers are fully vaccinated at West Royalty School? Well, like I said earlier, um, we, we have vaccination rates on a voluntary basis. If you go back to September 4th, um, we do know that the vaccination rates at all schools has improved, but that's why we are now entering into uh, a policy of mandate, sorry, uh, mandated vaccination test policy. Um, so I, I won't be giving you the answer you're looking for maybe to tell you it's 100% or not. Um, but I can assure you that the vaccination rate is based on baseline data because uh, people have the right not to divulge their vaccination when we collected it. Um, but I can assure you that when this policy is in place, that assurance is there and that a policy will be in place at the end of this week. Gord? So that was a direct qu question that I'm asked from people in my area. And um, um, I, I, I understand what the policies are going in, in place, but I, I want to be clear that, that I, I wasn't necessarily happy with how you came to the baseline data. There seemed like there were some gaps and it's affecting, it's affecting people in, in my community. And I want to make sure, was that, was that, this is my last question, so for now, was that an optional survey um, that was given out to, to, to teachers and staff, or was that mandatory? And were they, can you tell me a little bit more about that? Because I'm just concerned. Yes. So it was for all staff. So when I say all staff, I mean all staff, uh, custodial staff, you know, support staff, bus drivers. Um, the survey itself um, was not optional, but what was optional is whether they divulged their status or not. We, we sought out legal advice um, and that is what we were provided to do at that point. Um, ask people to divulge their vaccination status. If people didn't feel comfortable with that, uh, there was no recourse for us at that point to say, um, you need to tell us, right? So um, the numbers we provided are, um, are ones that we're asked to to provide uh, by to CPHO, they wanted baseline data. I mean, there's there was all kinds of assertions in the public that the vaccination rate was this with teachers or, or not. Um, so we did our due diligence uh, on September 4th. Uh, people are just getting back to work to collect as much uh, information as we could to provide it to the medical experts. So that that was the process. Stephen, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I absolutely agree here with the statement on this uh, material you've provided that barring catastrophic circumstances, schools should remain open for in-person learning. And, and on that note, um, I, I think the best way to maintain in-person learning is to have precautions in place that ensure schools do not close. 
So if, if that is the position of the department, I'm just wondering what kind of feedback you got from the CPHO when you presented that as an important part of this plan in light of the Delta variant and other jurisdictions opening up and what was happening there. Uh, we had lots of foresight on what was likely to happen here. So what, when you brought those concerns forward, what, what was the answer you were given? Certainly, as we've done over the last 19 months, um, we've, we've taken all of our advice as it relates to, to matters of, of health and COVID from the Chief Public Health Office. And I uh, personally, I'm, I'm extremely proud to be an Islander and, and, uh, and the way in which she's led us on all, on all, uh, on all items related to health. Um, so, so we had uh, in-depth discussions um, with her regarding all, all the, 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 the concerns um, around the variant and the operations and that, and, and she was certainly looking to her other jurisdictions um, uh, as to, to what they were doing at that time, knowing that this um, was a, uh, a document, a plan that, that would pay change and would, would pivot um, should the, the circumstances be as such. So um, I don't know exactly what your question was again there, but uh, we, we have taken all of our advice um, from her. And, and I know, you know, to, to MLA McNeely's um, question, so, so we released the plan, but she's also released her guidelines that, that came directly from the, the Chief Public Health Office. And I'd encourage um, anyone who hasn't done so to look at those guidelines and to compare the two documents because they are they're virtually the same outside of some of the additional um, information that, that we provided around resourcing and that um, through the plan. Yeah. Stephen? Yeah, sure. Maybe I'll get more specific, I suppose. Uh, one of the things I've been hearing is uh, from students that are now in self-isolation as the critical aspect of the first week or two of school has kicked in here. They've missed their tryouts. They're missing their extra extracurricular activities. They won't make the teams they want to make. And uh, I don't think that's something the CPHO would consider in her guidance, but it should be something that the department and the minister bring forward. Uh, so what was uh, the response whenever you brought those kinds of concerns forward? I, um, thank, thank you, Chair. I'm, I'm, uh, I graduated from Holland College um, with the tourism diploma and, and from uh, University of P Prince Rhode Island with a business a degree, and, and I certainly um, don't uh, don't think I'm in a position to, to provide any sort of medical advice or, or guidance to, to Dr. Morrison. So um, we, we took the advice of, of her and, and her team of, of professionals. Um, as Norbert had spoke to, uh, we, we're in a position, or the public schools branch and the Commission Scolaire de la Langue Française, they're in a position whereby they need to operationalize those, that, those guidance, and, and they were able to do as such, um, realizing that they had done it last year as well. So, that's about things. Stephen? Thank you, Chair. So, I, I didn't hear uh, an answer to my question in what the response was when you brought that specific issue forward, and I certainly wouldn't expect the Department of Education to inform the CPHO on what health measures are, but. Um, children missing out on their uh, tryouts for their their school teams and the like is not something that is, is a health lens. That's an education lens, Minister. Uh, so when you brought these education concerns forward, what was said? I, I think yeah, I don't. I, I just want to yeah. yeah. Do you want to? Perhaps I can answer some of that, uh, Mr. Howard. So. Um, what we do know about the pandemic is that it's not a fair enemy. Um, so some things are cast aside, like tryouts, and I think there's many of us here that are parents, and we don't want to see our kids uh, not be able to try out. But ultimately, our goal is to have in-person learning, and if it means some students um, missing a few days or a, a week, um, it's very unfortunate, or, or two weeks. Um, but it is it is uh, a formidable enemy, this virus that we are trying to navigate through. And uh, in terms of, I think, something that is reassuring for all of us, that, that this plan is playing out in front of us right now. Um, you know, we had three days shut down of Charlottetown schools, and um, West Royalty wasn't deemed safe to be open until Monday. And uh, I think we should take uh, some assurance in that. And and uh, 
in terms of feedback back and forth, I can only applaud CPHO for uh, their approachability. And in, in, uh, you would have seen, and, and maybe we uh, could be accused of flip-flopping, but we did adjust the masking guidelines just as school was starting because we heard from our stakeholders. Um, they felt they weren't stringent enough. And when we went back to the table with uh, Dr. Morrison and our team, we arrived to the conclusion that um, maybe the masking guidelines do need to be more stringent. So I, I think we'll continue to have those conversations. Stephen? Uh, that leads into it. Another question for sure. Um, so why were, what, who was consulted and when in relation to this plan? It seems like the, uh, I mean, I know myself wasn't, I, I was not consulted, although the, the offer was made for a consultation. What offers of consultation were made to the teachers' unions, the, the parents for input? So who, what was the consultation process prior to releasing this plan? one week before teachers return to school. I, I appreciate the question and, and we, uh, we, we certainly were, um, we weren't in a position to, to release anything until we received the guidelines from Dr. Morrison's office and, and as such, once, once we did, um, we did connect with our stakeholders, um, the Home and School Federation, QP, TF, um, and and we received some feedback from them uh, following following that. Yeah. So we I think we had sent it to them on the Thursday or Friday, um, I believe. And both and major unions, uh, Home and School Federation, um, were consulted. St uh, Steve, when were they consulted? Sorry. The question was when were they consulted. Um. Uh, Deputy, do you know? Once we received the guidelines, like the minister said, once we received the guidelines from CPHO and they were incorporated into the back to school plan and that was pushed out, then then we, they had received embargo copies, of course, before, quite a, quite a few days before, I think. I think, Kelly, you had had some conversations with them as well. And, and then the feedback, we sat down with them when Norbert alluded to that, we sat down with our stakeholders and, and said, you know, that they were asking for more stringent measures with masking and, and we listened and heard and, and that's yeah, when we had adjusted it. Stephen? In consideration of this uh, school closures and COVID-19 impacts on children and the fact that we want in-person learning uh, so much the, and, and the fact that the, the Delta variant is closing down school systems all across North America and many jurisdictions, anytime school was opening up, we were seeing it. Um, it, in the back to school plan, it said that online learning would be ready in the coming weeks. So from an education perspective, um, should we not have been extra careful to ensure that the schools didn't close down before we were ready for that online learning switch? Should we have been extra careful? Is that the question? There. Yes. It, with, with the precautions in place in schools to try to ensure that our schools didn't shut down in the precious first few weeks when students are getting settled in, getting their login information settled, knowing that that's a vulnerable time, and we've heard the pre presenters tell us this, knowing that that's a vulnerable time, should we not have been more cautious? Well, I, I'm going to um, pass that over to Norbert in, in just a moment, but um, you had made comments about how important extracurricular activities are and and the startup of school, and and while I have the mic, I just, I, I couldn't agree with you more. It's, it's so important. And I, I do want to, um, I guess, acknowledge that these first few weeks of school to develop the school community, the learning community, are, are really important. And our teachers take that time um, quite seriously because it, it sets the tone for the school year. And having this happen so early in the school year has been a disruption without a doubt. Having said that, um, the teachers are doing a phenomenal job of making sure that students who are not in school, that they are connecting with them, that they do feel like they're part of a larger community. I don't know if you saw West Royalty's um, video clip that, that the uh, administration did. You know, like I think it's, it's really important that, um, you know, aside from the operation piece, and I'll let Norbert speak to that, but whatever um, hand that our schools are dealt, 
they're, they're doing a bang up job in supporting students and um, learning the informal curriculum that we talk about that happens within the school with the extracurriculars, with the, um, the socialization that happens. It's just so important. And um, despite COVID, um, our teachers have, you know, they're on the, they're doing online learning, the remote learning is up and running, and, um, and they're embracing all the students regardless of their personal situation. So I'm going to hand that over to Norbert. Yeah, so of, of course, I mean, we wanted the least restrictive measures as possible. Um, but again, we can't make that determination without the help of CPHO. So when they're giving us advice, um, they know the epidemiology. I don't, uh, we don't on this side of the table. But when they say, um, you know, you guys can have these least restrictive measures and operate your schools based on the science, then that's what we, we put in place. Um, and it's unfortunate um, that things evolve the way they have. Uh, I don't think any of us would argue with that. And to Tammy's point, um, we want our students uh, living the full school life. Um, we heard time and time again from students and parents last year about the restrictive nature of cohorting and things like that. Because it is, uh, if you've been in a school lately, um, the social connections and the learning that happens on the playgrounds and the elementary level is key to their development. And to have that pulled away from students is very significant. Um, so if you think of us talking with the health experts and putting in measures, um, that's what we did. Stephen? Uh, thank you, Chair. So, yeah, going, going back to that, I suppose, um, I mean, if we didn't have online learning ready uh, to go, and so we're vulnerable to a shutdown, and if those first two weeks are crucial for ch children's development in particular, um, I, I guess I, I'm just really flabbergasted that the department wouldn't be pressing for um, us to be at that elevated level so that we could ensure that, or, or further ensure in any case, there, there's no assurance ever with when you're dealing with this virus, but if we had extra protections in place to protect us during those, those few weeks, um, uh, I can't understand why there wouldn't be pressure from the department to do that. And I just heard uh, Norbert mention that the, the department wanted the least restrictive restrictions possible. And I'm just wondering, is that some guidance that was given to the CPHO when they were developing this plan? No, it's a, it certainly wasn't guidance that we would have provided, but we know as educators that least restrictive measures are optimal. Now, um, we're not making any, um, we're not giving any advice to the CPHO that we're, <laughs> that relates to health and wellness in terms of uh, epidemiology or anything like that. that that's, we're way out of our lane we're doing that. And uh, um, as I said before, the cooperation with that office has been incredible. And, and I, I think they do know a thing or two about health and wellness of our children as well and, and, and a developmental, uh, in a developmental way as well. So, um, you know, we would quickly, uh, quickly adapt, and we have over the course of the pandemic, if we're advised by the health experts that we're not doing well enough with our measures, well, then we adapt. And uh, the collaboration happening before the school year was that this was, this was a solid plan to have students go and function at school with some safety measures in place. And... Um, our students and staff have done an incredible job, and they continue to do it. Um, and, and we're okay with that. Trish. Uh, thank you, Chair. So uh, I want to unpack a couple of things that we've touched on here. So uh, Norbert, you had uh, mentioned, uh, and, and this is a paraphrase, but that the science around ventilation has changed over time. Uh, it hasn't. It actually it hasn't. Definitely has not. Um, we have been hearing from healthcare experts uh, since uh, July 2020. Uh, for example, 239 international scientists brought this issue forward uh, to the world stage. Since then, um, the World Health Organization, Public Health Agency of Canada um, have recognized that aerosol transmission of COVID-19 is uh, a, a huge risk in indoor spaces. Um, it's also highlighted in the CPHO guidelines that you 
you've referenced several times, right, that uh, ventilation in schools, it's recommended that that be addressed. Now, you mentioned that the recommendations from CPHO were in the long term to address ventilation, but I don't see that anywhere in the recommendations. Nor would that make sense, because we're having students enter the schools now. Uh, they don't need to be protected against, you know, aerosol just in the future, aerosol uh, contaminants, uh, you know, the COVID virus. They, they need that protection now. So, you know, why was it not, uh, why did we not see an investment in uh, portable air, air filtration systems, particularly for schools and classrooms that don't have appropriate ventilation systems? Okay, thank you for the question. Um, and just, just to clarify my own thinking, um, so you, you're citing research in June or July. Uh, the pandemic did begin in March, and, and I would beg to argue that the science did change a little bit. Um, there was all kinds of uh, um, experts coming forward that it wasn't transmissible um, through the ventilation systems. And I think our own chief public health office would say the recent cases would not be attributed to ventilation at West Royalty, so I just want to make that clear. Um, but as I said at the beginning, um, when we met with Dr. Morrison, I know because I was in the room, when we talked about the ventilation, we, we talked about the importance of ventilation, of course, and we're, we would heed the advice of, of her office when it comes to ventilation. But what we do know is that f to improve ventilation uh, at these 10 schools, this is not something that can happen overnight or during the school day. So we have a very finite work time for major overhauls of these systems to be used. Um, so, and we're not opposed to that. Um, but just, just to point out too, the Department of Transportation Infrastructure owns our buildings and we are responsible for maintenance of the buildings. Um, so it's a collaborative effort that we would have to join with them um, to, to secure any funding. But we have made the recommendation that there's 10 schools that rely on natural ventilation and we have encouraged and have uh, publicized to our school administrators that natural ventilation should be used in these schools. And every school has a joint occupational health and safety committee. Any issues that are raised with air quality, uh, we quickly uh, have air quality testing done. So it, it's not that we're saying um, we don't believe that there's a problem with the ventilation. Um, we are certainly committed to long-term uh, solutions that improve in ventilation in the 10 schools that don't have it. Trish? Okay, and so uh, what efforts have, were made then to, uh, to engage with the Department of Transportation and Infrastructure to make these necessary changes before the schools, you know, before school started again this fall? So, so I highlighted earlier, um, all the mechanical systems were tested. Um, there was some air quality testing done at some of our schools to ensure the air was acceptable. And we've always um, adhered and met, um, I, I believe there are the ASHRAE standards, which is the standard of ventilation in all our public buildings here in the province. Um, so we've met those and we've had meetings um, uh, in, in partnership with the Department of Education, Lifelong Learning and DTI um, about um, the 10 schools that have been publicized as not having ventilation. Now up until even today, um, there's correspondence being circulated about uh, the possibilities of um, um, portable devices um, that other provinces have been looking into. Um, so uh, the work is is continuing. I know uh, my director of corporate services was involved in a meeting today um, looking at the viability and uh, probability of secure, securing some of the, the, the portable devices that other, other jurisdictions in Canada have. Trish? Yeah, thank you, Chair. I just, I find it really concerning that we weren't, it, it doesn't appear that there was a, a, a lens on what can what is what can we possibly do to protect our children as much as possible going into the school year because the conversations about portable air filtration systems they should have happened you know well before now you're saying you're having that conversation today um, you know that doesn't do any good um, you know for students who've already been in the schools and we can't for certain say you know what spread did or didn't happen at West Royalty due to the ventilation systems quite honestly we simply can't say that. Um, I, uh, well, I know that that was not one of the 10 schools though, but there are other schools that are even more at risk because they do not have sufficient ventilation systems uh, to protect against aerosol spread of COVID-19. So, 
you know, when I when we're talking about well, CPHO said said this and and they didn't say that. It's very confusing uh, because we don't know what was said in, in these private conversations. Really, when I look at the guidelines, I see clear direction that ventilation systems in the schools needed to be. Uh, Repa needed to be fixed, they needed to be improved to protect against this risk. Uh, that's a risk that could have been mitigated by doing it earlier on. Um, I also want to go back to vaccination. That's another uh, topic that was touched on in the CPHO guidance. Specifically says that vaccination decreases the risk of uh, people contracting COVID-19 and spreading it to others, particularly unvaccinated populations like children under 12. Um, so that being said, again, I find it really frustrating to hear that uh, it, it was right before the school, school year started or after the school year started that you were co still collecting data about vaccination rates uh, from teachers uh, and, and staff. Furthermore, I don't understand why we didn't use a similar system to the PEI pass uh, where you used health records to check if people had actually been vaccinated. Why are we going through a system where we are just asking people to to fill out an anonymous survey so you don't even know you don't know where who is or isn't vaccinated in our school to protect our children. So again, it's very concerning this was last left to the last minute. Why was this not done earlier? Okay. Um, so there's a few points to be made there. Um, in terms of your um, your questioning around um, why was in the health records, uh, I'm not sure if that's what you said, but something similar to that, um, used to verify vaccination. Well, I can't speak for health sure. PEI. I don't have access to their vaccination records. Sure. So the, the question back to us was to collect some baseline data, and that request came in at the latter part uh, of, of August, and, and that's what we did. Um, the thing is, um, we have to remember our school staff are, are not at work, the majority of them, uh, during the summertime. So um, we did what we were asked to do and get the baseline data when we could. We, we swooped in on September 4th because we knew uh, we, have, we had a captive audience, if you will, to get the most data on that date that we possibly could and provide it to CPHO. Um, that is what we, we did. Um, and um, it, it may be in, in your eyes too late, um, but when asked to do so, we complied. Trish? Thank you, Trish. Oh, sorry. We, all, sorry, we also worked with unions as well because that was a very important consulting that we had to do in order to attain that information. So unions were very much involved in that as well. Well, thank you, Ashton. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because, again, um, you know, consultation with unions, it's, it's, uh, it seems like that's something that most certainly could have and should have happened long before the, the, the end of August, right? So, you know, I, I think, Minister, I, I, I come back to sort of what, what was the lens that was looked at throughout this entire process? I mean, when we look at what, what, is, what can we possibly do for the, the safety and well-being of children in schools to mitigate as many risks as possible? Because this is a, is, a, is a difficult situation, most certainly. We, there are going to be things that are difficult to control, but I've just listed things that we very much could have controlled and that the science was pointing us toward. Um, why was that not the primary lens that this plan was developed through? I have to look back at the last 19 months and, and the way in which Dr. Morrison has led us around all of our health efforts. And I think that we are, well, we see it every day, people from moving from all parts of the, the world to, to come to PEI because um, how, of how well we've handled the, the pandemic. There were so many things at play, especially the Delta variant, and, and certainly Dr. Morrison, she, she, I, I know in, in discussions with her, she's always looking to other jurisdictions um, for, for guidance and, and support. And we, if you look at, at what other jurisdictions have done, our plan is is not dissimilar to, to other provinces and territories, um, and it was created as such that that we could pivot and and adapt where necessary. Um, so, 
I, again, I look back to the success of the last uh, 19 months, and uh, I, I have to trust that um, our road scholar, uh, who has been leading the public health, offer, uh, health efforts, uh, has a good handle on the situation. Trish? Thank you, Chair. Honestly, I find that in incredibly unfair uh, to CPHO, actually, that uh, the guidelines, I just pointed out two areas in the guidelines that you've referenced several times, vaccination, mandatory vaccination for teachers would improve um, uh, or mitigate risk uh, of spreading the virus, as well as the need to repair or to update ventilation systems that are lacking within at least 10 of our schools and you know looking at how else we can improve ventilation so portable air air filtration systems i mean to put that on the weight of cpho who they did you know dr morrison it was in the guidelines um that is the responsibility minister of this is your responsibility uh, to ensure that um, everything is being done to mitigate risks as you know provided in those guidelines and uh I, it's concerning to me, very concerning, that, that that hasn't happened. That's all for now. Thank you, Chair. It is happening around ventilation. So it was in the guidelines, and, and as such, that's we're, we're acting on it. And, and those schools, there is the intent to get them all upgraded uh, within the coming year. So so um, it's it, that, that was only a couple of weeks ago that we got those guidelines. And, um, and, and certainly there's been a lot of work uh, done in that, those, those few w weeks around ventilation. So um, we are acting and, and uh, look forward to sharing more details around the upgrades as we move forward. So, and now, so now we're blaming Trish. CPHO for providing guidelines only a couple of weeks ago. Again, those conversations should have been happening long before a couple of weeks ago. Um, so I just, I feel like we keep, I'm hearing again, pointing the finger, you know, at CPHO, but from what I can see, you know, the guidelines were there, but long before, you know, we have been talking about the importance of ventilation, the importance of vaccinations and their effectiveness in preventing COVID-19 and uh, preventing spread of the virus. So, you know, I, I just, I, I would like this conversation to continue um, in a meaningful way without just constantly pointing, pointing back to saying, you know, well, CPHO, you know, they, they have given you some guidance on these things. And to say that, you know, well, we only got the guidelines two weeks ago, so, you know, the schools were locked all summer. We couldn't go in and do any ventilation upgrades makes no sense. Like, you could have been working on these things over the summer and absolutely should have. So that's all I want to say. Thank, Thank you. you. We have been. Um, ventilation, I think, has been front row and center in the media ever since COVID evolved. And, and we have been, and, and Norbert already alluded to, the HEPA filter systems that could be portable systems in schools, and that's something that we've already had worked with DTI, and they have been looking into it as well. Um, we, ventilation has always been, even though, as Norbert has mentioned, that the virus has changed, and, and it wasn't so that it was, there wasn't as great of a concern as it being airborne before and that's why but we've always ventilation has and i mean these schools were assessed long before the document came out so i i i just think it might be unfair to say that you know we're blaming cpho because we didn't receive it in time it, this has been something that's been ongoing so just one quick follow-up on that one last question and then yeah. i'm moving to michelle so the uh it's my understanding there was uh, funding from the federal government that was provided in April specifically to upgrade ventilation systems. Can you tell us how that money was spent and was all of that money spent uh, uh, and on what schools and, and in what ways? I'll start this, this question or this answer, sorry. Um, I, I do want to point out too, um, these are multi-million dollar investments to uh, retrofit schools for, for ventilation systems. Um, and I'd also point out that during uh, the vast majority of this 18 months of the pandemic, we have not had cases. So comparing us to a Quebec or an Alberta, it's not a fair comparison in terms of cases. So you're, you're looking at a multi-million dollar investment um, to, to improve air quality. So as, and I don't think anyone here is trying to blame CPHO, but in discussions with CPHO uh, in the summertime, um, you know, Dr. Morrison w was clear to say that ventilation seems to be becoming more of an issue in this as we learn more about this virus and her her question and her advice back to um, to us was can ventilation be improved can that be a long-term goal for the improvement so uh, we are willing to collaborate with uh, the department of transportation 
transportation infrastructure, or sorry, I think it's just infrastructure now. Um, and that's what we've been doing. And like I said, right up until today. So uh, I don't believe it's fair that um, we only received this guidance on August and we're only acting now. Uh, we've done everything we could to maintain the systems we have. Um, and we, we want to improve the ventilation at the other 10 sites. Um, and uh, I have not been involved in the, the funding application because I believe that is a, a DTI uh, responsibility. Michelle. Hey, thank you, Chair. Thank you, everybody, for being here. It's the biggest group I've seen in one of these standing committees, so thank you for that. Um, I'd just like to go back to ventilation. I want to make a statement. Um, ventilation air quality shouldn't be a priority because of COVID. It should have always been a priority. And it should always be a priority because our children sit in those schools for six to seven hours a day in the same air all day long. And I get they go outside every once in a while and that kind of thing, but ventilation should have always been something that we prioritize so that our kids have the best learning environment. If they don't have good air quality, they don't have the best air quality. We can't claim that. So. A question to um, the minister. Um, so we've had COVID now since March 2020. Um, we've had the potential to feed into two capital budgets when it comes to air quality within our school system. Did you request air quality be improved within our schools in the last capital budget? I was not the, the Minister of Education at the time. Michelle? So continuity of government doesn't mean that the responsibility of a minister ends. You would actually should pick it up and continue. Can you tell me, was ventilation requested with from the Department of Education as a, as a priority for this government? Because I'll just be clear. Show me your budget. I'll tell you what your priorities are. So if we didn't actually put ventilation into our capital budget requests from the department to feed it up through the Department of Finance to then send it through here to the Legislative Assembly, it's not a priority. So was it requested before? Has it been requested into the capital budget that we're currently feeding into that is going to be tabled in this Legislative Assembly next month? Yes, you'll see it in the, in the capital budget. Michelle. Thank you, Chair. Um, pilots are pretty easy to do, and if we wanted to improve air quality, test to see if HEPA filters work in our schools, whether it be the air system from Aris or whatever, HEPA filter or whatever the brand name is that you're looking at, um, pilots are actually pretty fundamental to back up any claims and to back up any funding requests that you make going towards the capital budget, because we know not everything makes it in. So has there been a request to do a pilot program on ventilation within our schools of the 10 that are, um, that are on the list that do not have mechanical ventilation? Um, uh, thank you for that. Not that I'm aware of, but uh, I, I will say that that's a great idea. I mean, we, in education, we do pilots often um, uh, to see if it's viable and a good, a good solution. And so uh, that's something I surely bring back to the table when we're having discussions. Thank you for that. Michelle. Thank you, Chair. I'm just going to point out, COVID happened in March of 2020, but we should have been looking at air quality well before this. I mean, Tosh is a great example of where air quality really potentially impacted our students. If, we weren't, if our eyes weren't opened for Tosh, um, I would have to say that we weren't listening. And we're, now we're in a situation where we're saying, well, it's COVID, but it's not. It's actually the day-to-day -day health and safety of our kids in the school system. So I'm going to quickly move on to um, the timeline that you gave us. August 18th, received advice from CPHO. August 23rd, shared publicly. Um, was the, um, so I'm going to back up a little bit. I know operational plans are made per school. The schools are very different makeups. I represent schools that have 700 kids in them, all under 12 years old. Um, so the makeup of that school would be very different than if you're looking at a school with 115 kids in it. That might be, you know, like a K-8 that has a mixture of kids that can be vaccinated or not. I represent a school system where we've got 72 kids sitting on a school bus for a very long period of time in order to get them into their schools. So based on the administrators playing such an integral role into what the operational plan looks like for their individual schools, 
I will say I've heard from a couple of administrators that they would have gone above and beyond of what the recommendations were for in the school plan anyway because they recognized that our kids were vulnerable, not masking on school buses when, when you know, they're sitting in the same air quality for an extended period of time. We've got kids with 29 kids in their classroom. I heard of another one that's got 33 kids in their classroom. And our capacity issues at our schools, especially the younger ones, um, where they're not vaccinated, doesn't give the administrator the ability to spread those kids out into smaller classroom sizes. So that's a concern. So based on that and what we and our knowledge of what our what our I guess what our enrollments are in schools, are you looking at what the capacity is within our school systems today and are you making any recommendations of any school catchments that require um, expansion expansions or new facilities or anything like that? Have you fed that into the capital budget that's coming up this month? Norbert, you can uh, so I, I think I understand uh, the question. Um, so, so we do have a, a few capital projects on the go right now, as, as you're well aware. Um, the Stratford uh, High Committee, um, the Sherwood uh, School Committee, and then we have some major renovation projects at Montague Consolidated and Elliott River and West Royalty. So, um, so they're obviously they're they're on the go right now, and we'll address many of the issues you spoke of the capacity. Um, I have also um, have um, looked into the the three intermediate standalone schools in the Charlottetown area about the constraints that are being placed uh, on the students and staff there because of capacity and um, are, am dedicated to um, providing that information to the board of directors at the public schools branch to say um, do we need to you know enact um, um, the school review policy for these three schools um, because there's some concerns about the trends of uh, mm -hmm. population moving into the Charlottetown area and uh, those schools being um, overtaxed um, in terms of capacity. So um, they are a few that we are certainly looking into. Michelle? And this is my last, my last question. I um, have worked in project management, product management a long time, and I recognize that you always need to do a post-mort after something goes not according to the way that you had intended it to go. And I think we all can agree that when the plan went out, that there's nothing wrong with going one step above of what the bare minimum recommendation is that's being sent to you so that then you always do have a little bit of flexibility. That's just fair, you know, you, you plan for something not going according to plan. Um, are you doing a post-mort on how this consultation process worked? And have you identified anything that you would do differently if you are pushing out plans or any type of thing that requires consultation from multiple areas within the school system going forward? Have you made changes in what your consultation process is? I think it's a good um, question, Michelle, uh, and, and certainly we had this discussion yesterday um, around um, what, what is the plan moving forward, say there are to be changes, whether significant or insignificant, um, how do we how do we best engage? And and we've had these discussions uh, directly with uh, the TF. At one point there, I was I was on the phone with them almost on a daily because I wanted to make sure that we were in constant communication. So um, I think it's really important that um, our stakeholders are engaged, involved, and I uh, I I endeavor to continue to enhance those relationships as we move forward. Yeah. I would just add to, um, again, uh, a good good suggestion, and it's something we do do at the public schools branch, uh, and we do use the word uh, post-mortem. Um, and, you know, when we had cases last year in, uh, sorry, a case in Charlottetown Rural, we did a post-mortem about that, and I would like to say it, it helped us to improve uh, how we worked with the West Royalty outbreak. So it, it's something absolutely um, we want to collaborate with our partners, as the minister just said, um, and uh, reach back out to our stakeholders, such as Home and School, uh, QP and TF, to say, you know, uh, was it good enough? Uh, how can we improve? So, thank you. Tamara? Thank you. 
I, I, it, as I'm sitting here, it occurs to me that a lot of the conversation is predicated on, on the timeline and, and the, the perceived lateness of receiving the direction from CPHO. And as I listen to the conversation, I'm reminded that um, the information was received at a time where they felt that CPHO felt that they were in the best position to advise us and provide those guidelines. And I'm very appreciative of, of the points that have been made here, um, particularly around, you know, what can we learn looking back? Um, but, but that's the sweet spot, right? That we, we need to make, we, we need to get the best and most up-to-date information from CPHO to make the, make the decisions that we have. And so, um, you know, I don't think any of us apologize for making the plan that we did, given the time frame that the information was given. And, and to suggest that we would rush CPHO in providing that information, um, you know, but again, I do appreciate the points that have been made, but I think a lot of the conversation really is predicated on that point of the timeline and, and the perception of it being very rushed and inappropriate. And, and I would suggest that um, CPHO did a great job of giving us that information and for the operational plans, for the um, learning plans, for all of that to, to come together very quickly. Um, the situation at West Royalty is very unfortunate, um, but again, it, it was a community spread that was brought into the school and yes we we can talk about the increased measures that we need to have um, in schools and and those are those are in play and and will be implemented so so thank you for the opportunity just to make that point board yeah thanks for that um, just going back to ventilation um, the back to school plan contained the following quote improvements to ventilation systems are recommended in schools where they do not meet standards. Who put that passage in the plan? Was it the CPHO or your department? I, I believe that was CPHO. Gordon? And the reason why I'm asking that is I started asking questions on this early this year. And I asked them to the minister and I asked them to the premier. And I had no, I, I, I really could not, couldn't believe the answers where there was a lack of wanting to move forward to use COVID or what we're doing as an opportunity to build back better. And there was no, it was a very reactive approach and, and here we are today. So the way I look at it is we've, we've lost time. We've lost an incredible amount of time in, in, in helping the kids at these schools. And you know, it, it's funny because I, I didn't stumble across this in the media. The first time I'd heard about this was from a teacher who said that they have to open up the windows. So it's an actual person in one of these schools that we're talking about that did that. So it, it is an important issue, all right? And I'm not really convinced about the answers I'm getting right now. So my question is, exactly what criteria is being used to determine if ventilation systems on the island schools are meeting standards? So Mr. McNeely, as I said earlier, um, um, the DTI do have standards and we've always been told that our school buildings meet industry standards and uh, ASHRAE is the acronym that's used, um, um, the standards that they uh, comply with and we, we have no evidence to say we're not in compliance with those standards. Now as I also alluded to earlier, if there has been a change to the standards, I'm not aware of those changes. Um, Board. Will you commit to releasing um, all the internal criteria used to determine the standards and subsequent test results of all individual schools showing that, that either meeting or exceeding the outlined criteria? Do you have that data and will you release it? So speaking for the public schools branch, I, I would not have that data, but I can take that back to, um, to our team to, to determine what we do have. Gordon, it just, it just be, it's becoming, it's becoming an issue. And I, I, I look back and I read through the transcripts and this is something that the public needs. Why are we not taking the opportunity um, to do this for our, for our kids? If the federal government does not, I don't, I don't know where we are with this. I don't know how close we are to making this move. If the federal government does not provide support with this is the, is the province, Minister, are you prepared to do this alone? Are you prepared to fix these 10 schools alone? 
the federal government and, and based on yesterday's results, I, I can't imagine, I, I believe that $5 million has already, um, it's, it's already a part of our, our budget. I, 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 we are prepared to do it. It's going, it, the, the design work's already underway um, and it's, it's, there will be upgrades to our ventilation system this year in the months and years ahead. Gord? The federal funding would be instrumental in the improvements. Um, you know, quite frankly, the public schools branch does not have, you know, millions of dollars to upgrade these these buildings without the federal funding or accessing other funding. So, um, like I said, we would certainly be right there at the table to say, let's improve what we can improve. Gord? I don't know how we can afford not to. Um, just a, another topic, just want to ask the minister. Are you in support of mandatory vaccines for all educational staff in this province? Thanks, uh, thanks for the, the question and um, certainly I was uh, pleased to see the, um, the Chief Public Health Office issue a, uh, an order whereby um, staff will, will be required to, to follow the, the vaccinate or test policy so uh, I believe they all We'll have that operationalized by the end of the week, and uh, I think the uptake on vaccinations has been incredibly high within the schools. But um, clearly, we we'll want to bring it to 100%, and, and that's precisely um, what we're what we're aiming to do here. So, um, yes, I, I think we we all need to be vaccinated to protect our our kids and all Islanders. Gordon. Yeah, and, and my final question right now, and it's 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 coming back to an important point. Um, the the kids in my area, I'm worried about them. I'm worried about when they get when they get COVID and what that means and what that does to their psyche. Um, you know, they're they're struggling. They're they're tough. They're resilient. The staff is great. Everybody's done what we could after this, but. It's, it's the kids' mental health I'm kind of worried about coming back when, when they deal with something that's been so huge in the media and now they have it and now we kept it out and now they have it. What are, what are we doing? What are we doing to help those kids now and into the future um, deal with the potential trauma that, that this might bestow on them? Um, thank you for your question. The Students that returned to West Royalty this week um, were greeted by the student well-being teams. We had them on site at the schools, as well as additional school counselors present in the building. So that will be an ongoing plan as students continue to return to school to have those supports readily available to them. Um, Charlottetown Rural last year, we did the same thing. We brought our staff in. We had kind of scripted messages that could be read in the morning to reassure children. So all of that work is coming from the Student Services Department and we'll sort of stagger it as kids come back because they will be re-entering at different times. Thank you. So just um, to kind of take a breather here for one second, I know that there are still some community members with questions. Um, just keeping in mind the time, the original schedule that we had, we, as a committee, we still want to continue on with our questions and that will basically, then we'll have to come back and decide our further steps. Just throwing that out there for the committee to be aware. Gord? Oh, yeah, that, that sounds good to keep going. I just wanted to maybe offer uh, a minute break for our guests if they have to, you know, take a second or do whatever. <laughs> I thank you, but I think we'd rather continue on unless the I guess would like Just the bathroom break, maybe. Continue on. Perfect. Corey. Uh, thank you, Chair. I just wanted to touch on the ventilation systems again, and uh, so I know there's been quite a few questions on it. Um, I, Norbert, you had talked about the. There was a question on the money from the federal government and where that was spent. Can you, I'm just trying. Can you just kind of jog my memory on that again. I was just trying to recall your answer on, I think Gord might have asked a question, or might actually might have been Trish, on the money that was the 10 million from the feds. Oh, the, the dollar figure. Um, but uh, I do know there's federal funding available. Um, so um, just to paint that picture again, so uh, 
DTI own our buildings, uh, the 56 schools that we operate, um, we're responsible for maintenance. So um, the ask uh, from us is that we do have 10 schools without mechanical ventilation that could use improvements and, and hearing that there's federal funding available, uh, we would partner with them. Um, that's, that's my level of knowledge about the, the funding. Corey? Which, uh, which 10 schools is it that doesn't have the... Uh, they are listed publicly. Um, I know uh, one of the local media outlets have uh, listed them publicly, so, yeah. Corey? I'm assuming that part of the discussion around ventilation is that it's probably not as easy to just go into 10 schools over eight weeks and replace 10 ventilation systems in schools. That's, I, I would be great to do it, I, I'm sure if we could all go, you know, um, and I'm, there's probably not even the contractors to do that work, which I'm assuming is part of the consideration. Um, and I know that's probably why CPHO <laughs> realizes that that's not all work that can be done in eight weeks, so it's, but it's a, it's a long-term goal that we should have, and as Michelle mentioned, it's, it's, this has been an issue before uh, COVID uh, arrived on our doorstep, so I just kind of wanted to point out that I'm assuming that that was an issue. I know that there was quite a few questions on that and, you know, why couldn't you have, you know, uh, all the ventilation systems and all the schools upgraded for this year? I don't, I guess we've had two summers. I know, I think Montague, part of their renovations was a new ventilation system, which I think is complete for this school year, which is really good because there's quite a few students in that school. So um, we're happy to see that. But I know that there is 10 schools that don't have that. Um, but I just... I thought it was probably important to point out that it's probably not as easy to just go into 10 schools and replace ventilation systems uh, in eight weeks like that, simply because of contractors and, and whatnot. But um, anyways, besides that, on the actual back to school plan, I was just curious, when, when the plan was made public, were principals of the schools consulted before the plan was made public? The Monday, correct? before I think it was Norbert yeah so uh, thank you Mr. Deagle for uh, the comments about the ventilation because that, that is a reality um, uh, none of us here would argue that we shouldn't take the opportunity to improve ventilation uh, we are experiencing all kinds of headaches with uh, you know securing contractors to do a lot of our work and as you well know in your home writing of of Montague Kilmere, the, the Montague Consolidated has, has been a challenge and uh, to get contractors there, but I mean, the work is, is going well, but it, it's, it's, and we also have to remember most of these 10 schools are of uh, a certain vintage that there's all kinds of protocols that have to be followed to keep kids and, and staff safe while the work is being done. So it certainly has been a part of the, part of the frustration. Um, in terms of the principals, yes. So um, we we have uh, great relationships with our administrators, um, and all along, uh, we've been keeping them in the loop in terms of where we thought this was headed. You know, we did have a meeting with the Dr. Morrison and her team on August third, um, where we talked about uh, we're hoping very few measures would have to be in place compared to last year, and there was a collective sigh of relief from our, our administrators. Um, and, uh, you know, as things changed, um, we, we kept in contact with them to say, you know, uh, we're concerned about the Delta variant, as is Dr. Morrison. So um, they were given uh, the plan before it went public uh, to take a look at, and uh, um, we, we received uh, really no concerns back of any Variety and, and I and I do want to point out too, um, being the director of the public schools branch, uh, I get lots of feedback uh, from parents uh, on almost everything um, associated with school, and and I think it's important for this committee to know. I received minimal, when I say minimal, near zero um, feedback about the back to school plan from parents. Corey, uh, thanks, chair, and oh, sorry. Sorry, I just wanted to add something. <clears throat> I've been quiet way too long. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, but just with regards to your, your question about administrators, um, and Norbert started to allude to that, but last year, like, comprehensive plans were developed for back to school. So I'm talking not 2021 school year, but our 2021 school year. Um, 
and those plans were modified and adapted throughout the year based on the circumstances in the province and were also um, you know, in place and ready to modify and continue to adapt and we staff schools um, with that in mind and you know consultation is really important and we're never going to be able to consult enough in a lot of these big decisions and, and a lot of these um, you know uh, systemic initiatives that have to happen particularly around COVID and the timeliness of it is absolutely a challenge given that we have you know a school year is that 10 months and we have employees that are not in place over the summer and it's trying to strike a balance about engaging those administrators to ensure that they have enough time to be able to provide input that's going to truly impact them on how they operate operationalize opening school but also finding a balance that they have the ability to recharge and be equipped to support our students and our staff um, when school starts um, because that's really key and administrators carried a load um, that we can't even try to understand last year and they're carrying it this year for all the reasons why you guys are challenging us with lots of really good questions because they care about the students just like you care about your constituents and so I just want to um, just be able to state that because I do think like you know we're trying very hard to strike a balance of engagement um, but also respecting that people um, need it to have that time as well to be able to be prepared for a tough, a t another tough school year. Thank you. So again, I am going to just slow down for one second, um, keeping in mind that it is quarter to four. If we do want to continue on with the questions, we can. I do believe Corey and Stephen are still remaining with questions and Gord. Um, but if our questions go past for uh, essentially the next 10 more minutes or so, then we may have to look at canceling the next two presentations. Just want that to be kept in mind as we continue on with the questions. Corey. Uh, thank you. So I, I just want to say a few things, but I'm assuming that was a roundabout way of saying that the principals weren't consulted on this on this specific plan. Where the, I guess what my question was, were the, before the plan was made public, was it sent to the principals to say, so what do you think? You're still right. You're still on. You still want on. Yep. Yes. It, it was sent to principals um, in terms of how much time they had with it. I, I'm not going to say it was a lengthy period of time, um, but I would say, similar to my comment before, principals actually welcomed this plan uh, because it, it, it looked to them more normal than the year previous. Um, you know, uh, so um, they had it. We had no, um, no issues raised with the plan um, that came into my office. Corey? And I, yeah, and I, I guess I agree. I, you would mention Norbert on the amount of calls that you would receive. I, I received very few calls on the back to school plan initially when it was uh, released. Um, and I guess I think that there's probably when when we had first called the department and the public schools branch into the committee, I I kind of thought, well, we should have someone from the CPHO here because I don't. They're the ones that provide a lot of the advice on okay, this could work on the plan, this might not work, this is the reasoning behind it. Um, did I think it was fair to just bring in the education officials and, and grill you guys on exactly what the plan is without probably seeing the other side of it from what CPHO might have said? Because as a lot of my colleagues said, uh, well, be, you know, we don't know what the talks were between CPHO and education, or uh, the, I think someone said these private talks that no one knows about. So I can... I think, and it's easy to criticize after the fact. So I'm trying to be kind of fair in my questioning and understanding that at the time when the, the plan was made and the epidemiology at the time probably said that, okay, this this plan should be safe, it should work. Um, you know, obviously, the cases ended up in one of our schools. We had to shut down a number of them or a couple of our schools, uh, and we have to react to that. Um, do I think there are things that could have been done differently? Uh, not in terms of the cases in the school, but uh, maybe could the plan have been out earlier? I think that's a fair question to ask. Uh, I think it's a question that a lot of our colleagues said it was a couple of weeks before the school year. Now I understand that there's eight weeks and there's a short amount of time to get it done, but I think those are fair questions. Um, that's why I really wanted to have someone from the CPHO in 
uh, with you folks to help clarify in some of that. And I think, you know, there's fair questions, you know, do we, how do we prioritize ventilation? How do we speed that process up through infrastructure and tenders and all this stuff that has to happen to make that stuff happen? So I, anyway, I think some of the, a lot of good questions here today. Um, I think that some of it's probably, which was my reasoning at the last meeting was uh, attempts to garner a big headline some of the questions from anyway some of the questions i think were for that exact reason i think there's fair questions where the principals consulted the timeline this was released on um you know there was confusion about the mask policy you know it, it the, the plan was released and then it was changed um so i think there's fair questions around that and the ventilation um so i'll leave it at that i know that we have a number of topics to get to and there's more people that have questions so those are just the points I wanted to make. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Corey. Steve? Thanks, Chair. Mr. Carpenter, uh, did, you, did I hear you mention that you met with the CPHO on August 3rd and there was a collective sigh of relief from administration because uh, the plan would, would allow for a safe open it as uh, put out in the back to school plan? Correct. Um, I, we just had a check-in on August 3rd, um, and the check-in was, you know, things were looking good. The epidemiology was looking good, but there was, you know, caution there about the Delta variant and where that may go. And, and um, you know, it was just a quick message to our principals because it, it, they're worried. Obviously, their staff are worried what the school year would look like, and that it impacts scheduling as well. So if you're a school and you have to cohort, then you may need to develop an entirely different schedule. Um, so the message just was, at this point, things are looking, uh, you know, less restrictive uh, around COVID. So uh, that was a message that I would have delivered. Um, and then as we went down the road, there was nothing formalized at that point. It was just a little update. Your next day. Uh, Stephen? Chair, so the, the plan wasn't complete at that point. There wasn't a plan shared with administrators with a sigh of relief, just that uh, things would be a little more lax than last year or more lax. And some, w what exactly was it, Mr. Carpenter? That, that I just said in consultation with doc, Dr. Morrison and her team that, um, you know, things were looking good for school year being looking to look more normal than it did last year. Um, so it was just an update because, you know, we were receiving, you know, is there going to be cohorting? Do we have to change our schedules and things like that? So I thought it was fair to let them know that I was in consultation with, with the office and that things were, were looking okay. Now, there was no promise. It was just that things could change, obviously. But at that point on August 3rd, um, you know, based on the advice, based on the science, things uh, were looking we're looking less restrictive, and, and that's exactly what the message was. So. Stephen? Thank you, Chair. So when you're having a meeting with the CPHO and you're talking about a, a, the potential for a safe restart of school, uh, do tough conversations like uh, serious outcomes amongst our student population come up? And if so, what, what rate of serious outcomes is considered for, like, per 1,000 cases in our schools, would there be a serious outcome? These are the kinds of things that get covered in epidemiology. And was the, did the CPHO inform you of those specifics? Um, so, we, I mean, we, uh, like I said earlier, we, we had the luxury of having a great relationship with uh, that office. And, you know, um, the definition of a school outbreak is well defined in, in, in the guidance they offer. And a school outbreak is, you know, two cases that have no traceable link between them. So, the, so that's a serious situation, you know, where you have more than two cases. I mean, one case is serious. So uh, I'm not sure what you mean by the number of 1,000. I think that would be an extraordinary number. Mr. Carpenter still has the floor. Stephen? Thank you, Chair. Um, so when I'm talking about serious outcomes, I, I would mean a rate per 1,000 that uh, a child might, a student might end up admitted to the hospital or long COVID uh, or death even these kinds of things. Are those kinds of statistics shared with the Department of Education as far as epidemiology go? Okay, sorry, I, I, I didn't understand your question, but I do understand it now. Um, to my knowledge, that that is their work, and I take uh, great confidence in the fact they would advise us if that was something they need to inform of, us of, but I, I have not been privy to conversations where such rates would be, uh, you know, delineated. Uh, no, to answer your question. Steven? Thank you, Chair. Um, 
Uh, as far as vaccination rates amongst uh, staff within our system go, uh, I heard you earlier, Mr. Carpenter, mention that uh, you, you don't have access to the Department of Health's records, so you couldn't really do it that way. Uh, but uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, but the CPHO was the one looking for the vaccination rates of the teachers, and that would be under the Department of Health. So wouldn't you have just had to provide a, a list of employees and the CPHO could look up whatever information they, yeah, they wanted to? And uh, good question. Um, and we did explore different options. What was the best option? And that one was um, that one was considered, uh, um, and that was not the one that was chosen. Stephen, chair, and what, what reason was given for not choosing that option? It seems like the way to way to verify. I, I mean, I would never advocate for publicly releasing people's vac personal vac medical information, but the CPHO, like in, in either case. Uh, she's announcing that vaccine rates are not where she wants to see them. She's the only one that would need to be privy to that to make that decision or the CPHO's office. Um, it, what, what reason did we not go that way? Fair point, and Kelly may want to jump in, but uh, there was an order issued to us to collect vaccination, vaccination rates uh, from our employees uh, from the Chief Public Health Office. So um, when we received the order, we complied with the order. Um, but uh, Kelly, I'm not sure if you have anything to add to that. Say um, in my dialogues, just ta uh, in supporting staff, I guess um, some of the conversations came as to the reason um, they collect the information, and so there was some issues with regards to um, VoIP and privacy on how our systems um, interlock. So I think there would have been a lot of manual work that would have had to happen, and it wouldn't have been work that we could do. We're not allowed to access those systems. So um, we had to come up with an alternative plan to be able to do it. And when staff returned, um, we put out the request, and um, staff complied very quickly, and we're happy to to provide that information to us. Now with the order, we've been working with um, the Public Service Commission as well as the Chief Public Health Office now that there's an order in place on how we can um, quickly attain this information and validate, um, validate that information. So we're set up more from a legal perspective that we're able to collect that information and be able to do it. Stephen? Thank you, Chair. No, I'm good for now. Gordon? Yeah, just, get, just getting back to the um, to the survey. Um, how did you verify the results, and you know why? Why was it simply not done through principals um, to meet individually with staff? So um, it's a two-part question. Um, in terms of, we did explore different options to collect the most, you know, fulsome set of data. And we did uh, seek out some uh, advice from legal services. Um, and what was deemed um, the most confidential way to do it uh, without, you know, uh, sacrificing someone's privacy was simply very similar to what many of us did last night, like a ballot box type of, of format. Um, that may sound very archaic, but that's the advice um, we received. And uh, to put um, our administrators in that position of uh, asking, um, uh, that would compromise uh, someone's personal, personal choice. And that was our belief. So uh, we heeded the advice. It wasn't a decision that was made uh, like that. Um, and the, that was the, the path we chose. And as Kelly just said, the compliance rate was, was very high. Um, very high. If you looked at uh, the denominator of a school, meaning the total staff, um, uh, it was very close to uh, absolutely everybody in our system. Um, and then the, the numerator, of course, uh, fortunately for every school was was high. But uh, as Dr. Morrison indicated, there was there were some areas of concern for uh, a few schools, um, and uh, we've been circling back to ensure um, that we have. Uh, the most updated data, but I think uh, the order that we uh, recently received will help in, in, in uh, mandating vaccinations or testing. Gordon? And you mentioned very high, but very high is not exact. <coughs> the CPHO doesn't get on there and say we have a very high number of... It's not exact. We don't know. And that's where, that's where the validity of what we're talking about comes into question. Um, a written question answered on September 9th said the department was not tracking vaccination status of education s staff, and that was on September 9th. What, why was that the case? Why was that? There was a written question in here. So, 
And the response was from the department? Yeah. Gordon? Okay. Um, so I don't as the public schools branch, as, uh, as the authority uh, for the public schools branch, we, we asked our employees um, to divulge if they were comfortable, the vaccination rates. And uh, we, we would have said to CPHO, um, you know, we're giving you the data and this is how we collect it. Um, and whether there was issues with the reliability and validity of the data, um, that didn't seem to be a concern at that point. As I said, they wanted baseline data. I don't think they were asking. They wanted to have a baseline so they can make some informed decisions. And I would like to think the informed decisions have led them to the point where we are moving to a, a mandated vaccination test policy. Gordon? Yeah, and I mean, and then, then the CPHO comes up. Minister, what do you say to the fact that the CPHO got on there and said your numbers weren't high enough? She said that a couple, a few, a couple different times. She said the education staff numbers were not high enough. Minister, what do you say to that? Again, I think I think her um, her measure has has certainly changed as we've seen a, a general population vaccination. Like it's it's changed um, over the last weeks and, and months in, in terms of what she deems to be high enough, um, and that's that's precisely um, why now we're we're moving or she she's. Um, moving to a, uh, a vaccinate and test policy for our staff. So um, again, we, we gathered the, the baseline uh, data and had we provided that maybe, you know, a month ago or two months ago, that might have been high enough at the time. Um, but again, those measures are continuously changing as this, this pandemic evolves. Yeah, I know these are sorry, sorry, Gord, Kelly. I was gonna say, numbers were 93%, just to give you, to give you an example. I know these are questions. These are just questions that I'm receiving from people in my community. I, um, uh, okay, so now we're moving into a test policy. Um, my first question, if I had more questions, is is it flawed? Because we've seen too that that people get picked up on the second or third, you know, uh, test. So now we're moving into uh, the education is moving into a, a testing policy in the schools. Can you talk about the reliability and validity of those tests? I can't speak to the, the science behind the validity of the tests, but what I can tell you is what will be in place is that um, individuals who aren't vaccinated will be required to test three times a week and we'll have to witness those tests. So we'll have to witness mm -hmm. the test being taken and the results um, to determine whether they can come to work on that particular day. Gord? And then it just comes back to my last question, is that we're dealing with, especially in my area, um, with that outbreak, I, I can't stress how much I would recommend a mandatory vaccination for the, the, the people working in there. So I don't know if that's a question, but I think I started it before. Um, just, to, just we're all in this together, we're trying to, so that would be, that's, that's what I'm hearing. So thank you, Chair. Carla. Thank you, Chair. I've got three questions. One of them is really, really quick. Um, in good governance, um, the minister is ultimately responsible. Uh, minister, would you agree with that? Yes. Yeah. Um, Carla. Thank you, Chair. So it was mentioned earlier that when the plan was released that, that you hadn't heard from, from parents. Um, I heard from parents and I heard from teachers. And I recognize that it's because I have worked in the system, I've built a lot of relationships in the system, and I also understand what it means to work in the system. And one of my biggest frustrations, and I spoke about it in the House before, and I've been accused of not supporting civil servants, which is not at all the case. This is about supporting our civil servants. Many of the teachers I spoke to are also parents. A, they weren't comfortable sharing their concerns because they feared repercussion. And this culture of silence is going to really hurt our education system. You brought it up before and I'm bringing it up again. So our children ultimately come first, the people who work with them directly. I would say, it sounds awful to say they come second, but our children are there first. Their safety is our number one concern. So is there a mechanism 
in place, we have spoken about this before, Minister, so is there a mechanism in place for teachers to safely share concerns without repercussion? Yes, and, and thank you, and, and thank you for bringing that up in the, the House on, on several occasions and, uh, and in, in discussions one-on-one um, -on -one as well. Um, I, uh, I've made it very clear to um, teachers and all staff um, within our, our education authorities as, as well as the department that um, I firmly believe in open lines of communication and um, I, uh, I'm, I'm always really happy and, and pleased when I do, do get feedback, whether it's, it's negative or, or positive. Um, we've had some really frank discussions uh, with, with various um, committees and groups, the uh, PEITF um, uh, Teachers Advisory Council, our DACs, um, the Home and School Federation, the PEITF, the QP, we, we met with TF last week for, for three for three hours. Um, so, I, I in in terms of a a, um, a structured mechanism, I think all these various um, councils and committees are in place um, to to provide uh, that that open uh, dialogue. Uh, but certainly, if you have a suggestion as to what you think that should look like, I think we'd all be happy to hear about it. Tamara? Also, I just add um, that we do have uh, liaison meetings with the Western and Eastern Area Teachers Association, and I do believe that that format um, has been effective in highlighting teachers' voices in an anonymous way. Um, and it, it can be one teacher or it could be a group of teacher teachers um, whose concerns and comments are brought forward to ourselves um, to respond. And I think that anonymity uh, does uh, serve a purpose. Um, and I'd just like to highlight, um, in addition to what the minister has indicated, that there, I, I do believe there are various structures. And I will say that our deputy minister um, continues to have uh, an open uh, communication policy and is happy to receive uh, feedback, as are any of us. I'm, I'm concerned that um, there's a sense of repercussion, um, but I do think that there are um, modes for teachers to anonymously share information um, if they do feel that um, that's necessary. Kelly? From HR perspective, I would say that that's a big piece of work that we we have focused on for the last year and a half is really changing the culture and changing the mindset um, with staff that the HR team is there to support them. Um, we don't just support management, we support all employees. Um, we've done a lot of work with both QP and the Teachers Federation to try to like um, work on that particular culture aspect. I think we've made um, some um, some gains on that, but certainly if if we're hearing that people don't feel they have a safe place, and so I'd encourage you um, to like reach out even to myself, um, Ms. Bernard, to chat about that because we want to make sure that we hear staff and that they feel supported, and it doesn't matter what the issue is, um, whether it's the you know a policy issue or whether it's an issue that's happening within their schools. Carla? Thank you, Chair. And, and I appreciate those initiatives that are happening, and the reality is that, that many are still feeling stifled. And we don't have to look far. If we look to our health care system at our nurses, we don't want to be in the same position as our nurses. So we need to do better at that. I appreciate that we're working hard on it. It's easier for us to believe that we want a better system, but we really actually have to work towards the, the years of barriers that and, and the culture change that needs to happen to to change those back. Um, um, so I'm changing gears a bit. This is my last question. There was a report released by the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives in August 2021. It's called Still Picking Up the Tab, and it looks at federal, federal and provincial government COVID-19 spending. And I want to read a quote, Minister, and I'd like to get your reaction to this. Um, the federal safe return to class funds are now fully built into provincial budgets, except in Prince Edward Island. Poor budget disclosure makes it difficult to desegregate child care and K-12 measures. However, combining both still reveals $3 million has been received from the federal government, but still not budgeted. 
Thanks, uh, thanks, MLA Bernard. And I'm, I'm wondering if that $3 million, I might let the deputy speak to this, but I'm wondering if that relates um, actually to the, the ventilation system, because I understand that, that do those dollars have, have come from the federal government, but we still need to incorporate it into our, our capital um, plan, and it, and it is around that amount. Yeah, so 3.7. Yeah, 3.7 yeah, 3 million, so, um, yeah. I'm wondering if that's, if that's what it's referring to. Trish. Thank you, Chair. Um, so the, uh, it was mentioned that an order was, uh, was given uh, from CPHO uh, to gather the vaccination rates. Uh, and then it was also mentioned that legal advice was sought on the best way to do that. So I think this, that's kind of a, a really clear example of where the lines of, you know, what was, what was, you know, CPHO asking you to do, or in this case, legally like requiring you to do as an order versus what decisions were made by the department and the public schools branch about how to do that. So would you uh, be able to share the, the order, first of all, with the, the committee so that we can understand what exactly you were asked or d required to do? Trish? Yeah, so follow-up question. So I'm wondering, were there any other orders that were um, issued from CPHO regarding the back-to-school uh, plan or anything related to schools? No, not to my recollection at this point, no other orders. Trish? Um, that's, uh, that's it for now. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Sure. Um, just on vaccination rates, and Kelly, you had mentioned earlier in particular West Royalty had a 93% uh, vaccination rate. It, what was the percentage of participation in the survey? Um, yeah, we had uh, 73 out of 79 were fully vaccinated, and then we had um, partially and um, no disclosure to add to that. So um, we had 100% participation rate. Okay, great. Hal? Um, thank you very much, Chair. So, Minister, with... Um, the importance of, I mean, I know you guys are moving towards the mandatory uh, testing, um, and you talked about um, having full vaccination for, um, for staff in the schools. You'd like to see that. We all would. Um, so what do you say, so some of the schools only have a 71%, is my understanding, vaccination rates. So what do you say to the parents of those students going to those schools um, that only have a 71% vaccination rate to kind of ease their mind? Okay. That, um, it's, it's the numbers, as I said, were on September 4th. And when we dissected some of those numbers, because you're right, there's one at 71% and a couple others. Um, the way they were categorized um, were either you were vaccinated um, or you weren't or you weren't comfortable. So um, we um, have asked um, just recently, you know, is there an improvement in your vaccination rates? Um, and we're working on that now. Um, but I, again, I go back to having numbers such as that, which do not meet the mark, um, prompted um, everyone at the table to say, let's get a, uh, a mandate going where we mandate vaccinations or tests. So um, if, if you if you will, I'll go back to that whole premise that they wanted baseline data to make informed decisions. We provided it. Informed decisions have been made. Kelly? I was just going to say that um, some of the schools that have lower percentages, keep in mind that if um, they have a very small staff complement, and if, you know, one person indicated that they didn't feel comfortable sharing their status, it has a significant impact on those percentages. Um, but what it does, again, gives us the baseline, lets us work with the administrator and the school on promoting um, vaccination. And now with the order, we'll be able to, to mandate the vaccination um, or require the testing. So before I continue on, Hal, at this point, it is 4.15. So... We do, as a committee, have to make a decision if we want to continue on. I still have Hal with the floor. Stephen wants to continue on the question, but I think as fairness to our presenters that we at least decide to move on or continue on and postpone. And am I in my rights in doing that, uh, Clerk, in um, making a suggestion? Yes, the committee could decide to uh, postpone or reschedule the next two presentations if that's the wish. So I'm just asking, again, just keeping in mind the time of the staff and also of the department. Is there anyone who cares to speak to that? Stephen? I'm going to be really quick, I do believe, with my questions. Okay. 
Okay. okay. So we will continue on. Hal? Um, so thank you. Kelly, you mentioned that some uh, staff members don't feel comfortable disclosing their status. But, but do you think that's fair to parents who want to, to know that information? Um, because they're sending their kids to school and they want to be assured that their kids are not in jeopardy of having any risks. That's a fair question. I don't think it's a fair question for, for me to answer my opinion on that. Yeah. But what I will say is that um, there won't be a choice. And so you'll either have to be double vaccinated or you will have to be tested. And um, we'll put every measure in place to make sure that, um, you know, we're following the recommendations and making a safe place for students to come to school. So I, I appreciate the question. How? Uh, and, I, and I know it's not fair asking you that question. You don't make the final say. I'm sorry, but I was just kind of following up with you. So maybe I'll put that question to the minister. Do you think um, that parents have a right to know this information um, of particular schools because they're sending their kids there? It's, uh, it's certainly something that I think that, I, I mean, we could, there were some privacy privacy concerns. That's that's the reality, and, and I can bring it to the privacy com commissioner to see if it's possible. I know I know we're changing um, here very soon around the the vaccine test policy, but um, certainly I think it, this is an opportunity to seek that that guidance from the the privacy con commissioner uh, to see what's what's possible. Hal, uh, thank you very much, Chair, and thank you, Minister. And, um, I would love to to have that feedback also. Um, because I do have some parents that have that concern um, about the, the status of the staff in the school and sending their kids there too, because they, they want to, obviously every parent is concerned about the safety of their child. Um, so what do you say to the parents though who, who've called for mandatory um, vaccinations? I, I'd say that um, we are in the very best of hands uh, as it relates to our, our chief public health office. And again, I, I don't know how many times I've said at this, this meeting already, but we look back at the, 19, the last 19 months and, and the, the success we've had as a province. Um, I, would, I would say that, you know, we, she has, has put the order in around the, uh, the vaccinate or test policy. I was pleased to see it and um, we are going to ensure, the staff here are going to ensure that, that our staff and our schools uh, adhere to it and, and follow it and, and hopefully that'll um, provide peace of mind to all of our families across Prince Edward Island. Hal? That's fine, Chair. Uh, that's where we're at. Stephen. Thank you, Chair. Um, so we, we've talked about various consultations with various organizations and demographics, teachers and parents and uh, administrators, unions, all sorts of things, but we haven't really talked about students or the youth themselves who uh, we have an entire cohort of completely unvaccinated uh, and their perspective is extremely important. They don't really have a seat at the table other than through the child and youth advocate uh, who has is, is a position that's there to represent the interests of the youth. And through this whole process of determining the safety of our children and, and the uh, educational aspects of our children and the benefits to them, the risks to them, was the child and youth advocate uh, consulted at all? We, we did. I mean, it was distributed to yeah, them. Yeah, it was, yes, yeah, it was distributed to them. Um, and, and certainly, uh, we, as as a department and, and our educational authorities, we respect any feedback that that comes back from the child and youth advocate office. Um, we we have a meeting scheduled with them, I think next week, tomorrow. tomorrow. Yeah, possibly tomorrow. And uh, and and certainly we try to keep those lines of communication as, as open as as possible. Uh, we haven't heard from them regarding the back to school plan. Um, I know we had. Um, sent them an em uh, embargoed copy of it, but we haven't heard back, so, um, yeah. Stephen? Thank you, Chair. So I, I received an embargoed copy of this as well uh, a couple hours before it was released publicly. Is that the kind of circulation you're referring to, or was there some sort of contact prior to that with the Child and Youth Advocate? With uh, specifically regarding the back-to-school plan, no, it would have been that, that circulation. Um, but again, Knowing that this plan was was made to to 
be fluid and and we hadn't um, we haven't heard anything since since that was sent so um, Stephen? Thank you, Chair. You've certainly heard things from, from myself and from others, um, but uh, I, I would suggest that moving forward, the consultations be, uh, s drafts be circulated more than a couple hours before public release of documents like this that have huge impacts on tens of thousands of <coughs> islanders, whether they're parents, teachers, administration, students. You need to do the consultations before you release the public plan. Uh, that way, a great deal of all of the public outcry about What's not in the plan, what is in the plan, could have been addressed a long time ago in a lot of stress for a lot of students and a lot of parents and a lot of teachers who have reached out to me and others could have been avoided. So I just hope that the, the department takes and the minister takes this as a, a lesson in how to properly consult with Islanders uh, without creating uh, an issue with a lack of consultation. Thank you, Chair. Are there any other questions? All right, well, we do want to thank the entire team and the department uh, for coming in and taking uh, a little bit longer than uh, was expected. Um, so we will take a brief recess, and uh, the committee will discuss, uh, because of time frames, if we are able to continue on uh, with, the, uh, with the agenda as it stands. So we will take a brief recess. Corey. Did we have the specific time of the meeting scheduled until? Was it till five? Yeah. Okay. Is there? I'm just curious. Before we recess, is there? Is there enough time to do the last that next presentation in probably 30 minutes by the time we get going? It's I'm a, just. It's a fair question, and I'm more so like if we have enough time for all the questions, like for questions. I don't disagree, and I that's why I have been bringing that to the committee's attention throughout the entire afternoon. Um, I guess. Keeping in mind, uh, keeping in mind that you know the department is here, and of course our staff as well. So sorry, you do have something else, Corey. I'm just curious how long the presentation is. Is it a quick? If it's a quick one, maybe we have time. Tamara, yes. or Tamara, excuse me. I think Terry and I are prepared to uh, provide the presentation. We were given direction to keep it brief so that there could be questions. And so um, asking a question in response to a question, it really will depend on, on questions. the questions that the members have. Um, but I think we're, we're prepared to provide our information um, if you believe that the time permits. And there's two of them. For the second one. I have a brief, uh, you know, timeline uh, for the East Wilshire situation, and it, it is brief. It'd be more about the questions that follow. So, so I'll put it to the committee then. Um, do we want to have a brief recess and continue on, um, uh, trying to, you know, again keeping bearing in mind everyone's time? Um, do we want to continue on, or would we like to uh, take a break? Um, skip agenda items five and six, and then can and then go on to uh, and we'll have the clerk try to reach out to the department again to uh, try to reschedule for the items number five and number six. So I'm just going to put that out to the committee for your thoughts. Steve, that's a very difficult question because we're not sure what questions are going to form from the presentation. So it's it's hard to commit to. Uh, Yes, we have time, or no, we don't have time for questions because we don't know what we're dealing with yet. So in, in that light, I would say it would be safer to reschedule for another day. Okay. Um, Gordon? Yeah, I, I think these are two incredibly important topics. Um, I don't feel comfortable that there's enough time there for the questions that I want to ask. And ask, but I'm just yeah. Now I will mention to the committee as well and to our guests that we are on a limited schedule of pre presentation time, um, so that we do run the risk of what as well of not being able to accommodate. And again, it is on the departments and the public school branches schedule because um, originally when we had set up this meeting, the schedule was set to go with the four topics. And we all knew that that was going to be a, 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 lengthy, uh, a lengthy committee meeting. Um, so I'm just at throwing that out there as well, that if we do try to reschedule through the clerk, that we do have the possibility that, that, that we will not be able to have it before the House sits. 
Do I have any feedback from that, Gord? Well, I know that there's some there's uh, some with the technology system. I'm not sure about the the timing of that, or I know it has to. It only goes for a certain amount of time, I do believe. Um, but I'm I'm okay to stay later, or you know, um, just look at the look at the schedule and make some exceptions for these two next presentations at a later date. Some different options, I guess. Okay, Stephen. Uh, just going to throw it out there as far as options go. The committee can sit during the house sitting, and, and we can find a way to try to squeeze it in there. I know it's. But current. again, then we get back to trying to squeeze it in. Do you know what I mean? Like, again, I, I, I'm not. Again, I am the chair. I appreciate that. Um, I, I'm just trying to get everyone's feedback. But at the same time, keeping in mind the schedule and. Also, take, keeping in mind what Gord said, you know, the two topics, and keeping in mind what you said. You, we don't know, it's, it's an unfair question because we don't know what questions are going to come from the presentations, even if the presentations are shorter than what they were. So what I'm asking the committee is if we want to continue on and try to get go along as far as we can go, keeping in mind that the department was scheduled to be here till 5.30, I think, is 5.30, is that correct? Five o'clock, which gives us 35 minutes. Or if we want to end the agenda items now and try and reschedule. And again, bearing in mind, Stephen, what you said, that we can try to reschedule when the house is sick. Stephen. We can also split them up so that they're not in, in the interest of time try, trying to squeeze them in. Don't disagree. Is there any other, uh, is there any other feedback on that? So. The consensus is that we try to reschedule, or the consensus is that we try to continue on? Reschedule? Reschedule. Okay, perfect. So what we will do is we will take a brief recess so our guests can um, depart, and then we will come back and we will go to agenda item number seven and eight and include in that the review of correspondence will just go through scheduling. All right, thank you again very much for coming in and taking your time this afternoon.
Thank you, uh, and welcome back to the uh, Standing Committee on Education and Economic Growth. Um, so, as uh, discussed prior, uh, let me get my notes here. Uh, as discussed prior uh, and agreed upon by the committee, um, we are going to. Uh, we had to delay, unfortunately, the uh, presentation for the update on diversity initiatives within the public school system, and also the briefing on the recent incidents at East Wilshire School. Um, so. We will come back to that, if that's all right, uh, Clerk. We will now continue on, first of all, into the review of correspondence, and from that, we will go into scheduling, just to add on to the schedule. So the first point uh, is the review of correspondence, and I believe you all received the letter from the uh, Partnership for Growth. Um, is there any feedback from, first of all, the letter? Corey? They're looking to come in and present early. They are, um, yeah. So they would like to present. And now, going back, correct me if I'm wrong on this, Clerk, but we had, from previous meetings back in June, we had sent a letter requesting the uh, pandemic response as part of one of our priorities in prior, uh, in a prior work plan meeting. Um, so yeah, they are looking to present in person. So I will keep in mind that we are short on presentation time. We are also assuming, uh, once we get through this, that we are going to be trying to schedule in the department uh, MPB, uh, PSB back in for a presentation. So is there any other feedback? They are looking for an in-person presentation. Um, is there any feedback that any of you have? I might suggest that we do want to have them, but unfortunately at this time, you know, just because uh, of the timing that we wouldn't be able to accommodate them, but um, once, a once we have a better grasp of the schedule, then we can try to fit them in at the committee's earliest convenience and also their earliest convenience. Gord, did you have something or no? Yeah, no, I was just gonna say, um, it depends on if it's, if they're, if their plan is, I don't, I don't want to hold up their plan if they, you know, um, in the future. So I guess I'd prioritize them as coming out um, right after the legislature or very first on the list. And but maybe make sure that's okay for them if they want to present sooner. Then I would be open to, 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 to doing that. But, so that's a good point. And uh, maybe clerk, we can mention that uh, you know the committee is very looking forward to hearing their presentation, but. Unfortunately, due to scheduling, but you know, once we do, uh, once we have the ample time, we will try to suggest some dates as soon as possible. That sound fair? Okay, perfect. So that moves us on to uh, number eight. Um, but before we get into the new business, maybe we'll just continue on uh, with the. So I'm just going to make the throw the suggestion out there that because we could not get to items number five and number six that uh, our clerk reach out to the department and the presenters to see if they would be available. There are some times that are available, but now this is, uh, Hal, you had mentioned it, I believe, in our last meeting about our set date for meetings is on Tuesdays um, in the afternoon. There is availability on some Fridays. Um, we would not be available for Thursdays. So I know that this is uh, uh, something that the committee has wanted to hear on both of these topics. So I'm throwing it out there as there was, is this something that you want the clerk to try to schedule outside of a regular meeting time? Because if we do it outside of our regular meeting time, then as Stephen had mentioned earlier, it would probably have to be during the sitting of the legislature. So what is the committee's feedback on that? What are available dates prior to sitting? Um, there well, are um, on the f October 1st, um, so I could try to make something like that work. That's a Friday. Um, other than that, um, I could work to, you could either, if it was a priority, I could reschedule an already set meeting if that was the wish of the committee or add them on to, say, the 28th after Kathleen Flanagan. But that's another long day then. It, 
Yeah, sorry, uh, Trish. Um, and October um, 8th, the following Friday, I don't see anything there. Yes, I do have, um, uh, Peers Alliance is willing to come in that day, if the committee is willing to meet on that day, but we can also use that day for the department if that takes precedence, yeah. Okay, so as we're not really in the review of scheduling right now, is it the priority of the committee to have these two presentations as soon as possible. And bearing in mind that if it does possibly preempt one of the other presenters, then that is at least an option. The, Sorry, go ahead, okay. I just wanted to say too, um, originally the, this Friday was held for the Premier um, to potentially come in to present. I have not received correspondence um, on his availability or otherwise, so um, it is open if the department would be willing to come in that quickly, I could all, always reach out with that option. Sure. Uh, sorry, Hal? If the department was prepared to present today, so they shouldn't have any, they should be able to come whenever they're open. So I'm open for this Friday too, so. Okay. Yeah. Corey, I'm assuming you would uh, be all in favor for Friday? <laughs> okay, perfect. So we will uh, just essentially get the clerk to reach out to the department, just uh, offering up the dates that are available. And our next meeting is on is on Tuesday, correct? If bearing that the department would be able to come in on Friday. And so maybe we can review our scheduling at that juncture. If that sounds all right. Um, number eight, new business. Um, just, can, can I uh, Gord? make a suggestion? Can we send a follow-up letter to the Premier saying we did not receive correspondence, we just want to make sure you've received correspondence from uh, going out? about that so I don't know if it just seems unusual that we don't receive correspondence from the premier's office um, yes and I can um, advise that the letter that was sent previously um, on my behalf by Emily um, it did have a deadline to receive a response by um, the following Friday last Friday and I hadn't received anything um, so if, depending on how the committee would like to proceed we could send another letter with another deadline um, Okay, I'll just ask for the committee's feedback on that. Again, I think we run the risk of time to present, unless, like uh, you had mentioned, see that we are presenting during the legislature. But it, it, it is entirely up to the committee if we want to, because we had sent our last letter, I believe, last week. That, yeah. Sorry, I'm going to let the clerk go ahead first and then you, Trish. The only thing I was going to say was um, an option that the committee could have it's a briefing on a report. The committee could given that there's not very much room in the calendar, um, request just that the report be produced if the committee wants to see it in like written correspondence. Okay, before that, I'll go to Trish, unless you want to comment directly on that. Yeah, well, that's essentially what I was going to say, actually. Oh, that, okay. um, you know, certainly the offer, we may want to repeat the offer for the Premier to come in and present. I think it's a, it's really important to hear from you know him directly. Um, however, uh, at this point, uh, because it has been pushed back and back, it would at least be, you know, something to have a copy of the report or some sort of update, uh, you know, so, or <laughs> acknowledgement that we would like this information. I mean, I think it's quite... Uh, uh, ridiculous to be honest that we haven't heard back so uh that would be my suggestion yeah that, that we would like to see him in person um at least give us something in writing yeah okay and that's relatively the committee's wishes to send the letter okay so we'll do the same so uh, resend a letter asking for presentation if not uh, the report perfect any other new business dramatic pause I'll ask for an adjournment motion. Thank you, Hal Perry. This meeting is adjourned.